video. I'm back live streaming some drawing and we're going to have a look at what I'm working on at the moment. This is actually a commission and then I'm happy also to talk about you know game design anything like that um, just put your comments in the section down below if you're watching the vlog after you can always leave me uh, a comment beneath and I can try and answer it. I'm going to be doing much more of this sort of thing as I work on projects and we have a, a design project coming up which is going to be Christmas themed and I'm going to be designing a, a solo player game live. I haven't thought about what it's going to be like. Uh, maybe there's going to be a Santa theme um, but I'm going to design that whole game live and work on it and then you'll be able to and then publish it and you'll be able to download it and play it for free. But um, that's coming up. In the meantime, one of the other things that I do is I um, I draw maps. You're probably aware of that if you know my channel. And today we're working on a commission. So let's take a look at that. Now, you will occasionally see me look across to that direction. That's because the way I have things set up here, I've got two tables. I've got my computer over there. And I'm looking across at the screen occasionally just to make sure that I'm not making a complete cock up of things. Um, because really, broadcasting and doing all this stuff is kind of second to the actual physical activity. So hopefully things look all right. If you've got any feedback, let me know. Right, I'm gonna try and also um, watch the comments right, section. Also... There you go, that's my little audio test. Watch. There we go. So I've got um, chat up there if you want to say anything and let's just uh, summarize. So I am working on a tomb for Midnight Tower. They are a great um, company, little indie company, who do their own RPG stuff, and I draw the maps for their products. And um, I'm doing the uh, tomb for them at the moment, like a dungeon in a sense, and they sent me this map, which has got details on it, it's got the names, and then I've got also got room descriptions here, which I am going to refer to as I draw. Now. Two days ago, I did a stream where I did the pencil outlines for the map and um, added in the details based upon the descriptions. Now, they've got back to me. I sent it off to them. And they've asked me to include a um, some tunnels here to go underneath this ravine, this crack, this chasm that split this structure in two. You can see it there. So I've got to, first things first, I'm going to add that in. That is the one correction <clears throat> that needs to be added. I think when you're working on um, any sort of commission, it, it varies hugely. But once someone gets to know your style, then they uh, kind of like appreciate your design ability. And whether that is a good level of ability or not. Now for me, just because of my experiences, I'm quite capable of of adding in lots of my own little uh, details and ideas and and concepts, and they love that sort of thing. If you work, if in fact, if you work with any designer or creator, and you can contribute in the design factor, then I think that that really pe people love that. Okay, and um, uh, that's what we'll see here today. So uh, we'll, we'll see how this works. So they've asked me to put a tunnel in here. Now, how am I going to draw a tunnel? This is underneath this section here. And I am inclined to always try and add a bit of three dimensions to these things. I have to admit, I um, um, I draw mine all from bird's eye point of view, looking straight down on the details. I don't add slanting walls to add the three-dimensional effect. I just feel that, that that it betrays what you're actually seeing. If you look in Google, let me just slightly change this. Hang on. All right. If you look in Google, Google Maps, and um, yeah, I think that's better framing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you look down and you look directly down on things. That fascinates me. That's what I'm trying to replicate in a sense. I want to see directly down and see all the details. And um, that's 
that's kind of where I feel it is at for me. And that's the side of map that I draw. Um, I do some isometric stuff, uh, some of my other games that I create, because uh, I don't just do maps, I do games and all sorts of things like that. And um, uh, so that that's what we're going to be looking at here. So um, we need a tunnel. So a tunnel is going to it's going to need some kind of slope down, isn't it? I'm not going to draw steps. I want to create like a hole here, and this hole slopes down into the darkness. Now. You can't see at the moment, but what this, what it needs, let me remove that little stone there, is an edge. So this edge is the far edge there, and that is the slope. And then this will be colored in, in a darker tone, so it sinks it down. And this is the edge of the ground here. So what we might have are some lines that kind of slope down. Once I've done this, once I've just added these tunnels, you can see how easy that is. Okay, just like that. Easy. And it's kind of grading. I'm going to ink this in um, today as well, and maybe even start colouring. It depends how far we get. And then if we go to this side we need another tunnel here if you remember they point that out and then um, we need a, an exit here so I'm gonna cut it into here so they're gonna go down underneath this section here and it comes out and there so we've got this edge of the ground and then the slope up and we'll kind of shade in that area this would be and a tunnel underneath this big crack. The earth was torn asunder. So we've got two tunnels. So that goes underneath there and underneath there. And I'm using shade and um, this edge to emphasize that that goes down beneath and underneath there. I might just sort of turn that a little bit up, this one. That looks like it's going that direction, and it needs to go this direction. So I'll just swing this side around a little bit. And just like that. So it looks more like it's going directly under. Because this separates, this map is larger here, you can see. And um, it's got two parts of the dungeon, if you like. You come in here. Oh, it's upside down. It comes in, you're coming down here, and this you progress through this section, then you come into the second part where it all kind of happens. At the end, um, the dramatic, there's lots of cults and bits and worship centers and prayer rooms and stuff like that in this particular, particular one. Okay, so, um, what we'll do now is let's have a look at what implements I'm going to be using. So I use a I use the you know, UniPin fine line pens. You can see them there. They they are awesome. I've used the micro ones, micron ones, and I don't find them them lasting as long. I find these last longer. They're just a bit tougher. Both of very similar quality, and and so I've got a 0 0.05, which I'm going to spend quite a lot of time using, because especially there's some fine details in here. And I might use a 0 0.1, which doesn't seem to be next to me. Let's have a look here. Here we are. Right. There. So 0 0.1. That's about, that's about it, to be honest. I don't use too many more when I'm designing this. Right, let me just let, let the cat out. So I open the door, and all the cold air comes in, and he sits there looking out. And um, he's spotted something outside, and he's gone. 
I'll show you some pictures of him at some point. Pan. Pan the cat. He's a he's he's uh white and ginger. And he's a beautiful cat, he's about two, three, that sort of age. So he's got quite a bit of energy left. Um terrifies my daughters sometimes. Oh, oh that's not what you want to do. Drop your pen. Okay, so we have here some steps. Um probably not the nicest thing to start with, but um, let's put these in. Now the thing about steps is, right, people are like, oh, they must be so straight. Nah, these are stone-worn steps with an edge which is um, tired and battered. It's an old tomb. It doesn't need to be straight. In fact, that's one of the things that's so good about drawing dungeons. Things don't need to be straight. Stone, back then, if you like, if you can refer fantasy to a period as like medieval, wasn't cut by big blades, throffing with liquid. It was, um, it was done by hand. You know, like I am doing this map by hand. So, if I ever feel like the lines, I will go in now. I'm going to. I'm going to use some shading. It won't be a maximum amount that I, that I would do if it's just a black and white map because some of the shadows will be um, drawn in with pencil, as you will see. For me, um, drawing maps like this, I like to go that up and down. Preferably down. It just I find I can draw straighter that way, and if I go sideways, that's much it's much worse. <laughs> Not quite that bad, but um, it is quite bad. So for me, it's just down. So I spin the map round, and I I try and hold the pen quite far down. I find that that. It gives me slightly more control. You see, I will go into these stairs. The, the floor is going to be grey. It's like a tomb. And I will think about the edge and the shadow. It's cast down from the edge. So the shadow for these steps, I know they look sort of a bit rough. You won't really notice it. Is it there's a little bit of shadow this side because this is going so this is the surface and it steps down there steps down and there'll be shadow just below so I'm going to do a little trace along there for the moment and um, this kind of comes to life once you put the grey on it because I'm going to be colouring this one So they kind of look, look a bit like a collection of wobbly lines. <laughs> These will become steps. Now another thing about this map is I'm not adding the grid for this. They like to add the grid themselves, which is perfectly understandable. Uh, most maps I draw, I am. Um, I had a grid too, and I, I, I've got the grid underneath, and I will sort of trace through the lines in a rough way. They create a, a rough um, type grid. The lines, I, I don't completely draw the lines, in, I just sort of roughly draw them in, but not today. All right. Now, one thing I do do is I add in some kind of marks where people have scuffed or left a trail when you're drawing on stairs you don't just draw straight up because people don't walk st mark straight up stairs okay their feet go either side so you tend to get kind of marks that don't connect and that way it makes it seem it's a funny little tip it makes it seem like 
they're actually going up those steps. This is kind of like one of my trademark things. I like to, um, I like to have a little trail, if you like, through the dungeon. Now, this was the first room I drew yesterday. These pillars, I think I'm going to keep slightly larger than a lot of the other pillars in the dungeon. This is like the big entrance room. So um, I'm going to keep these slightly larger. And I've got to draw these circles in there. It's, it's the whole, one of the most horrible things is when someone commissions you and you look at it and you're like, that is full of circles. How am I going to draw that? I don't use rulers very much at all. I draw everything freehand. Um, again, I go back to that principle that these are old dungeons and things aren't perfect. You know, you've got a rough look. Like so. And by the time it's sort of all coloured in, getting them exact shapes is, is always tricky. So they kind of they kind of look like that. And behind them there's gonna be kind of scuff marks. So the minute these that sort of comes into play, you start to take your eye off. In fact, I probably will just do a bit of cross hatching in these because they're um they're pillars, so it's just cross sections like the walls. As you can see I've cross hatched all the uh, all the kind of the earth around this tomb around here all right and as I was saying before top tip for me whether this would work for you or not, I don't know, but I find just sort of just feeling the circle rather than trying to draw straight lines, I kind of just break it up a little bit as I do it. Now, thankfully, this, this map did not have lots of circles, which is a relief. Um, so, right, so for these pillars, let's think, I'm going to do a cross hatch. I'm going to do it slightly different than that. I'm just going to do it like this. Slightly thinner cross hatch than the actual underneath here. So it's clearly a cross hatch, and if anybody's in chat and they hear the music, tell me if you think it's too loud. That would be really helpful. I've put some music on in the background. It hopefully it's playing, and um, it, hopefully it's not too loud. It's kind of I want a nice relaxing vibe. Seth, thank you. Thank you very much for putting that in there. How are you doing, my friend? Ah, cheers. Uh, hey, Nightbird Games. Um, don't hear anything in the background. Ah, okay. Music is fine. Maybe that's because it's quieter. I, I want it quiet. That's the thing. I don't want this... Um, I don't want it being too disruptive. And... I was trying to play around with the light as well because I'm near a window. Hope, hopefully, it's not too. Um, C7D5A6. Thank you for that comment as well. Appreciate that. Um, so I'm working on a, a commission at the moment, guys. Just to, just to quickly recap, and it's a, a tomb. I've drawn the pencil lines in, and I'm now adding in some of the detail. Now, this is probably the hardest thing that I drew in the dungeon because I am really, I'm a map maker and drawer and game designer rather than a figurative drawer. 
So whenever I come to having to draw statues or or that type of thing, I'm always slightly anxious about about how that was going to work. I'm just going to turn this a bit like that. Um, because I can't quite picture it in my mind and I have to use quite a bit of reference if if that's going to if it's going to work at all. So um, I've got this little man here. So I've got to really try and picture it in my head. So it's going to be um, a, a circular head. And how how much of a nose do you see looking down from above? I guess it all depends on the particular figure. This guy's got a beard, so he's going to have stuff out the front. This is um, Tyre, the a god. Ah, so uh, good question, Seth. This is um, Unipin Fine Line. I've used these for years. I've, I've tried others, but these ones always last much longer. And um, for that reason, I keep going with them. I find the tip just, just lasts longer. Now, um, Nightbird's coming with a question here. Um, what is the benefit to cross hatching negative space rather than just filling them in with black for visual flare? Question mark. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I, listen, I would love to blot these in black. It would take less time. And I, I guess, you know, thinking about it, there's a number of things. Black tends to me mean a, a void or a, a something that keeps going like the bottom of a pit for example or the bottom of a chasm so you can't see the bottom so it implies depth when you put a cross hatch in you're kind of you're substituting a, 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 a you're creating an earth type effect it's like a substitute earth now i have tried in the past just doing stippling around it but i just find that that doesn't add a continuity to the cross hat to the um, to the cross view you know so we're taking like a section and then um, cross hatching as a style option is always something that people really enjoy I get lots of comments about people saying they they love just looking at the cross hatch <laughs> you know and um, for me it's really simple I just do four lines then four lines and I've got to make sure that None of them are going in the same direction, if you know, if you see what I mean. So in a space, you don't want ones going in the same direction that butt up to each other. So these little sets of four lines. Um, well, maybe we'll do a cross hatching section uh, session once, one time, kind of like meditation. So this guy, he's standing here. He's got his. So, but yeah, people. <laughs> I've had lots of comments over the years about. Love the cross hatching. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. It just takes a bloody lot of time to do. That's the problem, you know. So this is a wolf, kind of here, biting the hand of the god. Now he's got his leg out, his knee and his foot here. And he's on a kind of like rocky outcrop. This is like this is like a sculpture in the middle of the map. And next to him there are these dwarves, these slain dwarves. I assume he's slain these poor poor little buggers down here. And of course the problem. The scale is such that it's very tricky to work up exactly what they're wearing or any details, you know, what their eye colour is. You just can't do it. You've just got to go with implied um, image and imagine maybe armour. Um, and these guys, they're part of this sculpture. There. So, 
the, the description for this room is um, this room contains a statue of, of the deity Tyre um, who is fighting if that's how you say it T-Y-R um, Tyr maybe Tyr Probably could be Tyr I've often just read these about these things in my own brain rather than Bring, I haven't brought this this I haven't brought this god into any of my uh, role playing. He is fighting a really huge wolf, which is this one here. Okay, uh, uh, which uh, Tears right hand is in its mouth. So his right hand there is being bitten. If you can kind of see, as I say, this is this is potentially. Not my strength when it comes to map making. And the sculpture includes fallen dwarves by the feet of Tyr and the wolf. There's also four pillars here. So we've got the four pillars. Right. So. Um, so we've got... I've kind of put it on a mound of stone, if you if you can imagine. Like a, a nice... Uh, mount or mound to, to rise to rise up the, the statue in the middle of the room now I've used quite a bit of pencil to sketch this out so I'm just gonna just rub it with the pencil and have a look and see what we're left with because sometimes the pencil hides some detail so look the side of the head wasn't really clear so I've lost a bit of definition on the head there, which is a bit annoying. Um, but I want to have to work with that. Okay. Wolf from above. I'm slightly better at drawing animals. <laughs> but get me an inanimate object any day, and I will draw that instead. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, let's not forget that there's colour going into these. Ordinarily, I, I put quite a few cross hatch um, lines and marks in these spaces. This is a dirty old tomb, so there's going to be dust around and all sorts of things like that. And so, and of course my trails, I, I like to have weaving out. Okay, good. So, next we're moving on to this section here. Now this is a flooded area, waterlogged corridor here and we have a waterlogged room at the top. I guess water areas kind of come to life a bit more when you're adding colour. I like to add blue to the water, even though, you know, if you look at water on a floor, it doesn't look blue. But I think you have to go with some visual clues sometimes. And um, doing light, I, I'm not one to add like paint, white paint onto my pictures or anything like that. I tend to find it, it adds a bit of in, in pesto and uh, impasto a kind of thickness to it and um, and I have never found like a, a proper white pencil or anything like that that really does a good reflective surface so I tend to go with like a, a blue an obvious blue and it's kind of like a fake blue if you like to make this more obviously water now um Another thing I do is the reflection will add a kind of like a, a silhouette line to the edge of the water and it kind of just makes it pop a bit. So I always put that in. And sometimes I'll do like a little, the reflection might be something like that. Can you see the little dashes there? Are we close enough to this? Is that, is that still in focus? I think it is. And you can see now, obviously, suddenly that is like a pool of water. Up against the wall, I'll also maybe make it darker. And that's the thing about um, shadow. So I could talk about shadow for ages, but shadow is an important thing for me when I'm drawing my maps. I, I'm always thinking about where are the dark points on a map? So 
there's going to be some in the corners here. Incidentally, these are where doors are going to be added. These sections here. They're basically um, added after by Midnight Tower, who I'm doing this commission for. They like to add their doors in and their, their own grids, which is fine by me. Um, there's another puddle down here. Another puddle in the middle here. So the implication is for the players when they're exploring this dungeon that um, they're going to be getting wet, I should imagine. Um, ah, hell yeah! Caught you live! Capel, uh, Capel and New. Capel, welcome. I'm glad you're here, my friend. And you can see this, they've got puddles and I've kind of I didn't quite know whether to completely flood this space but one thing's for sure by having lots of separate puddles I'm creating more visual interest that's an important part of what these maps are about I'm telling a story through this visual interchange if you like a kind of backwards and forwards narrative that you'll be experiencing as you as you look at it and um, for that reason, rather than just leave it, just paint, just draw it all blue. I thought, right, I'm going to add water in there, uh, puddles, shapes, patterns, get the eye going, and uh, just make it more interesting. Now, the edges up to the water, I'm going to shade in darker when I when I use the pencils later, and that. That'll mean um, that you get more depth. These will pop a bit once I add a darker tone. At the moment, the ground is lighter, but it will be darker. So that is on the way. Don't forget, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. It doesn't have to be about map making. It'll be about gaming. I'm a very experienced gamer, design games. So if you feel like asking me any questions about that type of thing, go right ahead. Or just general life questions. I'm happy to talk about just about anything. I'm a bit of a chatterbox. It drives my wife insane. But um, at, at least the house isn't completely silent or anything like that. <laughs> well, she probably wants it that way. But um, yeah. So, there's the waterlogged corridor, which is, looks quite, quite entertaining. We've got the waterlogged room up here, and we've got some more pillars. Now, do you remember I was talking, I don't know whether, if you were here last time, I was talking about the size of pillars across a map, which sounds like a weird conversation. But if you were creating your own dungeon, would you have different sized pillars throughout that dungeon? I guess it depends whether it was built at different periods of time, and it could be that. I could use that as an excuse. If I'm going to do a design element in something, I like to have a reason for it. I think it just gives so much more believability to what you're looking at. So we've got this size pillar here. These pillars over here are about the same size, but if I look further on, we've got like a prayer room here with smaller pillars, but that could be because they need more space in the room. So I'm quite happy to go with these pillars just like this. You can see there's a crazy logic that goes on in my mind as I as I do things. And um, I'm always... It's almost as if these places are real, which kind of sounds a bit insane. But um, if you spend quite a bit of time doing stuff like this, that's partly it. <laughs> yeah, I would. Depending on the size of the room, the bigger it is, the more roof weight, which means bigger pillars needed. You see... Nightgate, Nightbird, you are um, Cody. You are um, you're thinking about it very logically, which I like because logic is is a good foundation for any anything like that. Um, for me, sometimes you know, having having looked at having studied art and um, looked at uh, architecture, sometimes there's just no goddamn reason why they've done these pillars other than the fact they look nicer or they want a particular style or fashion. Like uh, Corinthian pillars were very much a fashion when they were built 2,000 years ago, um, with their flourishes on the top, you know, and the, and their their kind of fluted sides. So, um, 
always so I, I don't know I'm gonna I'm gonna go with these bigger but there's gonna be smaller ones so and they, this is a dungeon so they've just got, it's a consistent roof above it so I'm not too I'm not too bothered but I like your thinking uh, Kappel always was fascinated with your technique small scratches on the floor dots and thin lines makes the space lived almost like well-traveled pathways real name is Nick Nick excellent so we've got Nick for Kappel and New and Cody for Nightbird Games. I believe that's right. Correct me if I'm wrong. And we've got Seth as well. Good stuff. And um, uh, C7D5A6. That is a chess move, is it? <laughs> um, is that like the? Uh, is that like some way of checkmating in like three moves? It doesn't. In any case, um, if you want to drop your name in there for using a different handle, please do. So, Nick, thank you. It's a colour. Oh, of course, it is a colour. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> I just liked the idea of it being a chess move. Um, yes, thanks, Capel. Yeah, it's very much my own style. There's less of that in this. Unless they specifically ask for it, because I'm going to be adding colour. So I don't want to put too many lines in for the shade, because I'm going to be replacing that. It's like doing it twice, and there's no point doing it. But a lot of my maps are black and white, and yes, I do a lot of cross-hatching and, and dots and lines. It does bring... Things would be lived, wouldn't they? If you were thinking about it, people would... If dungeons were full of, like, zombies, there'd be bits lying all over the place. <laughs> Um, if a dungeon had some kind of magical power coursing through it, throughout, I would believe some thin pillars would hold up everything, destroy whatever is creating the magic, and the dungeon collapses. That is a great idea. That's a wicked idea. That would be something that a player would kill a wizard or a mighty sorcerer, and suddenly the whole dungeon falls around, down around them. You're mean, Cody! <laughs> Right, let's try and get these pillars in. Remember how much I enjoy... Hmm. Let's do these quite big, yeah. You can do these big. Uh, doing the circles. Just imagine Cody DMing. You killed the... You killed the boss. But suddenly, the dungeon's falling down around you. <laughs> I'm I'm so curious. I'm going to write down what your color is. What is that that color? C seven D five A six. I will look at that later on. Oh god, I spent a lot of time in Photoshop. So um, I will I'm be fascinated to check that out. Right. So we had some cross hatching in some of these in the ones before because these are cross sections. As is the dungeon, so that cross hatching indicates, you know, a cross section, a large pillar. I'm just feeling around that pillar. Now, through my time, I have been very lucky to work in some really interesting places. I mean, I've done a lot of teaching. And then there is a crystal clear path without any de debris where, gelat uh, where the gelatinous cube cleared its way. True. True. Now, there's a good question. Gelatinous cubes, do they do they leave? I know they're, they're absorbing everything and they're kind of like the dungeon cleaners, if you like. But I kind of feel that it would leave trail marks where it just along the edge and it didn't quite get the dust and the dirt and it's left like a clear that would be a good that would be a good thing to put into a dungeon i've never used uh, gelatinous cubes in my games um there's something about them i just i don't know how i, I would think I, I always would struggle to implement them you know how, how would they how would they work in a role-playing game that is that is a that is a tricky one i guess you you would just fight it like normal but they are iconic, aren't they? Gelatinous cubes. I do love them. There was some gelatinous cube dice that I saw once. And I thought, oh, I've got to get those. Mind you, I see a lot of dice that I see and I would like to like to buy. 
pick up. Right, so we've got three pillars. And um, yeah, no, so pillars, they make me, they remind me of a place I used to work um, about about 20 years ago, probably a little bit longer than that now, um, the British Museum. I was lucky to work there for a year. Um, we just got back traveling from Australia for six months and I needed a job. I saw that there was a gallery assistant position at the British Museum and um, I just thought, wow, uh, I've got to go and uh, uh, have a look at this job because they'd open up some new galleries, um, the great rotunda in the center, the, the covered court was was being built. And I thought, wow, what a place to work because I love history. I love all my games and stuff like that. What would what would you find at the, at the British Museum? And the first thing you see is obviously this big pillared um, kind of uh modeled on the parthenon the greek ancient uh, temples and um i'm thinking oh these pillars are awesome you, you, you see the, and they are they're like massive you can't you can't they're like huge redwood trees they're not that i've ever seen those i've seen similar but not the actual ones in uh, is it canada those, those forests um but um yeah, you can wrap them, and they, they, you can put your arm in the slot where they're fluted. Just love pillars, right? So I've done a bit of. Um, think of something like Ghostbusters Two for the cubes. The more you you bully it, the angry it gets and comes after you, grows bigger. Wow. That, yeah, that's pretty terrifying. So we've got. Um, so we've got more water. So there may be more. There's a bit of a current almost here with this flooding. So we've got um, maybe some movement in the water. So we've got some ripples. So I've added in a few ripples here to give it a bit of... And I will just add a few kind of reflective bits here like this. You tend to get ice. It tends to be a bit more reflective like that because it's permanently still, isn't it? Obviously. So there, there, we've got some bits and pieces going on, which makes that nice. Now, the rest of the room, we've got to add some other bits and pieces here. So we've got another little puddle over this side, like that, and then some kind of almost like drops or splashes and uh, we've got a trail, some hash marks, and maybe some kind of trace areas where there was once water, tide marks if you like, there's going to be a double door here, let's not forget that. Um, C7 says, I used one the week before in an iconic way when players first think that there is a skeleton heading their way ah oh, of course it's kind of trapped in the cube yeah before i dropped a cue a clue about clear way but players don't pick it up no so they rushed to attack the skeleton and got stuck in a cube maybe what you could do to add a, an extra dimension to your clue is you could say um the skeleton is coming it's got a slight green hint to it and it could imply that it's magical but it also could imply that it's in some green tomb maybe that might be a cool idea yeah i love all that stuff oh imagination hey eh? right i'm going to just rub out some of these bits here because i can sense i'm missing some stuff right go yeah I could probably do a few more marks in there right so um, yeah we've got this water you can see I'm just kind of randomly randomly place stuff dotting it around and um, so we've got more water we've got this corridor we've got two rooms off this corridor a secret room and a, a kind of like a little bookstore if you like 
and that sounds cool c7 I, I'm I at the moment I'm not running any role playing games at the moment I'm thinking about running um, the Star Wars second edition role playing game which um, uses the the dice pool system d6s and I am keen to that I'm gonna run it for my my my, my teenagers I've got three kids uh, one of them's 19 so they're not she's not a kid anymore <laughs> Um, and I'm going to run it. I think, I don't know when I, I'm, I'm so busy with stuff. I'll come back to that. Uh, Cody says, um, I feel like ice magic would be effective against cubes. Turn them into ice cubes, then smash them. Now, that is, a, that's a great idea. And it seems to make sense that there's a lot of water in theory in a gelatinous cube, isn't there? And if, if I was DMing and you came up with that concept, you would definitely get brownie points. But um, I don't know whether you guys, depending where you're based, whether you'd get what brownie points means. But yeah, you would definitely. You, you would. I would re reward the inventive thinking. Because that sounds like a cool idea. Um, you said you liked post-apocalyptic games, Last Days, or County Road Z might be something you'd like to role play. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't played either of those. I have to admit, I'd love to play more games like that. It's, it's like I just wish that I could. I I'm not part of a games club at the moment, and the only one in town seems to play 40k. All the times, and I'm not really into buying all that stuff for 40k because I think it's such an expensive hobby. Um, I'm I'm keen to get into that sort of thing. I like um, there's another zombie survival game that I play. Oh, I can't remember exactly what it's called. They all kind of merge into my mind. Zombie side or something like that. I love that one, and I play zombies. Which is uh, bloody simple but really cool, just dice rolling, um, entry level type game. I love. It's just a lot of fun, and I can play it and drink port and just get drunk or merry, and um, I enjoy enjoy that one. Um, last days. Okay, I I I'll make a little note of that. Last days. Thank you. Um, I would definitely allow freezing the cube if my players had any magic. Exactly, C7. You can kind of... It's inventive thinking, isn't it? That's what you want from the players. It, it shows that they're kind of engaging in the magic of the world. You know, they will enjoy it more if they do that as well. I mean, it's so obvious. How do you fix an error if something happened in Drawing with Ink? Well... That's a really good question, C7. Um, there are a number of things you can do. I, when I scan it in, I can digitally remove it, so you can cheat. If it's like the width of something, so I make a door smaller than it should be, I will maybe thicken the other side. Um, if it's a detailed drawing, I will draw it in pencil first. So I, I kind of... Um, aware of um, the, the kind of the parameters some of the details when you add ink it inks thicker in a sense than the pencil I use a, a 0 0.02 pencil so very thin thinnest you can get really without going stupid and I people don't notice mistakes <laughs> you just don't notice it I mean there's so much detail You've really got to look carefully if there are. And there are some errors in my maps. But I don't know. It kind of adds a bit of character. I'm not too worried about it. In the beginning when I first started drawing these maps years ago. Maybe I would have been a bit more concerned. But now I'm not so bothered to be honest. I just, um, just get on with it. 
and like these I'm drawing these books this is like a little library but it's kind of wet and soggy and a lot of these books have kind of been destroyed and I'll kind of roughly add some tattered stuff in here improvising as I go you know just thinking I'm there that's the thing one of the tricks of drawing is and this isn't going to make you a great draw or anything is just um, try and picture what they look like in your head <laughs> I know it sounds crazy but that is and people will say that but then you think oh that's obvious but then until you actually do it it, it takes quite a lot of practice to be able to do that and, and visualize these things. Some people are good at it, some people aren't. Like the people who draw bodies and physiques just like out of the bat, like like comic artists who draw it out of their heads, I'm like, wow, that is supreme. They've done a lot of work studying the physique so they can picture it in their minds, but then there's the occasional person that does it naturally and they just like, they can embody human bodies in their mind, it's crazy. Cody comes in, there's a game club in my town and it's a group of cops that play on the weekends. They said they're going to give me a call to play. Never did, lol. Cool to think cops play D&D roleplay, though. Are they playing D&D at this, cl at this, at this uh, place? Or are they, you know, they could be playing something else. I don't know. There's obviously lots of uh, different types of roleplay, as we know. It kind of, it's almost hard to imagine. But why not? They're just people. You know. Okay, so um, that is funny though. That uh, that image will stay in my mind. Say so fifth edition. Oh, cool. I guess one of the things about fifth edition is it's it's nice and flexible, and you don't really there. There aren't too. It's not rule heavy, is it? Really. Um, you got your your checks, your saving throws, combat's a little bit fiddly, but you can put some figures down, which helps visualize the different um, sequences um, yeah why not <laughs> um, Cody also said I imagine these books would be covered in mold or ruined with all the moisture from the nearby exactly right Cody's on the money yeah you're right yeah they are all kind of mouldy and as you as like as I was describing, you were typing it, and I kind of and I'm just imagining they're kind of kind of battered books and they're kind of a bit kind of torn and and wet. These ones over here aren't so bad. This side's definitely a lot worse. In fact, the shelf has got a slight crack in it there, and um, they've got these kind of blocks in the corner, kind of bookends. And there, and da da. Then we've got that kind of add a bit of shadow in there. That's fine. You can see how just adding a little bit of depth there it suddenly pops that shelf out, doesn't it? Bang! Lovely, love all that stuff. Right now, I have used quite a bit of pencil on this, and um, so I'm going to just go in and just rub that pencil out and it does actually reveal that say there's a bit of the shelf line that's missing there so I need to go in and put that back in just across there like that I think actually you know talking about that Cody I think one of the great things about doing maps, playing role play games, playing board games, discussing, just talking about this sort of thing, it opens up, and incidentally, there are doors here that are adding in later. It opens up this whole thing that we want to use our imagination. We want to kind of test our thoughts and ideas I think that's the beauty of it we, we are in a sense self-reflective and we kind of we find ourselves almost in a captivating moment when that when imp implementing imagination just gives you that buzz you think wow I thought of that or you look at someone else and they have this great idea and you're like suddenly caught up in that idea that's what role play does it it 
takes you into those worlds. And that's what that's what a good book does as well, doesn't it? It takes you to that place. And we all want that. We all want magic to be real. Even the most miserable people would, would have to admit that they would love to have something magical in their lives. You know, and I think, you know, a, a nice friendship can be magical. I think that that's, that's one of the beauties. That's what I'm trying to tap into when I'm designing my games. I want to create that magical um, existential moment where you're off in another world. God, that is just, it's just so awesome. The, the human mind, we're so lucky. Right, Nick has come in. Something I always struggle with is map revelation if the map is bigger than just one room. Covering with paper. Ah, yes. Um, just never works. Shape and direction always gives everything away. Yeah, that is really tricky. Yeah, I just plonked the room down. <laughs> I guess one of the things you can do and when you think about this, if you put a room down, is um, you, you, and you've got characters or figures in there. You don't have to explain where they are to begin with, do you? Um, maybe. So if you had, if you had, say, say you had a group of um, zombies in a room, but they were down the far end of the room around some tombs, and the players would come in that first entrance. They won't necessarily see those zombies. If you tell them that it's dark in the room, but they get a rough outline, it, I guess it's tricks, isn't it? It's circumstance. And then if they say, right, we're gonna we're gonna light another torch or use a, um, a, a light spell, then they will um, suddenly the zombies will pop into life, and you can place them, you know, potentially. Another thing I've seen done, I haven't done this person, I've seen it on a video. Someone did some, um, cut out some arcs, if you like. They cut out some curves so that they could create like a curved light effect. And they also cut out some funnels and some uh, that tapered behind pillars that were in the room. So they couldn't see behind those spaces and you could put those down. Again, we don't have a huge amount of time to prepare these things, do we? That's part of the problem. You know, um, you, you get like, I'm struggling now. I'm preparing this this Star Wars game for my teenagers, and I'm reading through the script, and I'm I I read through it, and then, I, then for some reason, three or four days passes, and then I'm like, oh god, I need to read through that bit again, <laughs> and I'm rereading the same bits all the time to try and keep the storyline in my head. Yeah. But um, it's preparation. So you just need preparation time. So you use, often I, I was running last year. I ran a game of War Within, which is one of my role-playing games that I made. You can pick it up on RPG. No, no advert, just fact. Um, and I, I had a massive map on a whiteboard because this was while I was at school. I what I. I when I was working teaching at school, I've been doing this job full time for a year now. But while I was at the school, special needs school, toughest kids you can ever think of, playing role play with me, and I was running these sessions for ten to fifteen children. <laughs> they were each role playing their own country. That well, the leaders of a country, and. Um, we had, oh my god! Now that was that was challenging, but boy, using their imagination, these kids who are deprived kids had really harsh upbringings, suffered abuse and all sorts of horrible things. All they wanted was to escape for that short amount of time, off into a world, and use their imagination. And just be this leader of another country. And they may r rage war against their fellow students. Or they may send aid or launch ships. Or, you know, there's all types of things going on with this um, with this game. And, you know, it, I just think we're, we're just lucky to have these hobbies. And, and I'm super privileged to be in a position where I can make modules uh, for Dungeons and Dragons. 
and um, make my own games. I use multiple papers so that I could move them to open next room and leave other hidden, others hidden with multiple sheets on them. It definitely gives out some layout, but not all. Usually, I'm fine with that. Yes, C7. I, you know, uh, that that's definite. And the nice thing about that is because that gives me. You could almost use a, a kind of like a 70 gram weight paper, which is almost transparent. This is what I work on. You can see beneath it, and it would give you kind of like a clue maybe to the layout. You can have varying. Maybe you could even use uh, like a tempered. Um, like an opaque piece of, you know, um, cookie, uh, baking paper. Roll that out. Yeah, I, th I think little techniques like that are, are awesome. Now, this is a secret room. It's got books on a shelf here. Um, it's got a cabinet, which I'm going to put a little bit of wood texture on. Just kind of, just a bit like that. And um, just generally a relaxing space, but it's secret. This is a secret door. As I say, these doors will be added in afterwards. And you can see the trail where the door is going to be placed. And there's a comfy chair. Now, this is another, this is an example of how um, I kind of expand out the. Uh, the descriptions. So this is room 9. Described in the text I've been given by Midnight Tower as um, a shelf and a cabinet in this room hold various valuable items such as incense, oh yes, golden goblets and more. So we've got like this incense holder here and there's some I'll put draw some lines in for some incense smoke kind of coming out like that and so to that that short description now I've added a comfy chair we like a comfy chair here in the corner in there like that a table with a lamp we've got a, 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 a lyre or uh, some kind of guitar there um, I'm going to put a little bit of shading in this one because it's not so bad I can do that with this one there because this is a fairly dark space and then I put a rug in the middle now I haven't quite lined it up properly so this is a good example of how I might adjust something with the ink after so this is like a rough rug. It's not massively ornate. Just brings a bit of comfort to this space. And it, it will probably be a kind of like a, a hemp rug or something like that. But there's a lot of stone in this tomb. And there's I'm doing some lines that indicate the direction of the thread. Like that. And then when I colour it in, I might add I might add a bit of colour. See how I feel at the time. Um, like so. I've kind of there's a lot of water next to this particular room, but there's no mention of water leaking in, so I suspect that the walls are pretty sturdy. Um, which hopefully um, holds the water back <laughs> it's quite close it hasn't come through but we'll just leave it like that and the uh, midnight tower can worry about that now here this is just an underground water tunnel so I'm just gonna uh, um, just put some waves if you like some current in there direction kind of makes it feel a bit more watery there you go right moving along this corridor this corridor has um, lots of sort of trails and kind of drag marks down it, apparently. Because something has been dragged, I suspect, or the water has been kind of trailed along. So I'm going to put in 
some other little marks. You can see I'm very light with the pen. I, I don't need to press heavy. If I need to go in hard, I will. I always go soft on the mark first, unless I'm doing some sort of exercise. Okay. So we've got trails, and they lead round to a... Ah, good question. So this this grid here underneath is um, half a centimetre. Can you see? Can you see that right? Half a centimetre. So we're looking at a small grid here, Nick. And that means that the, the detail is, is painstaking sometimes. I'm really have to use the thinnest pens I can. I do have a, a 0 0.03, but I find there's not much difference between that and the 0 0.05, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, so these ones just last a bit longer and are more readily available. So, right, we are now, um, oh, I'm along the corridor still. We're dragging along. Now, one of the things that I needed to make sure I add in the dungeon is some broken surfaces because um, it's an old tomb and Midnight Tower requested um, that uh, there's lots of sort of geometric patterns, more details, um, basic flagstone floor. I haven't really, I don't really go with the flagstone so much when I'm drawing just because if grids go in, it gets very confusing on a space. So if I start drawing cubes over here and then they put a grid over the top, it doesn't. I don't think it looks very good, to be honest. So I tend to leave those out. It, you know, and, and happenstance is it, it does actually mean less work for me. Because <laughs> if you have to put like a whole load of grids in, uh, flooring in, it just takes ages. And I don't necessarily think it's that great. <laughs> Do I use some kind of uh, magnifying glass? Um, uh, no, no, I, I don't. I, in fact, because I'm filming, I'm as well. I'm not going in as close as I normally do, so I'm kind of seeing a distance. But that also says a lot about <laughs> my sensibilities in the sense, in the sense, that I, I'm, I'm not too bogged down in getting the detail right, and that's. Um, uh, maybe that's a bit lazy, but I think it frees me up a little bit. So yeah, what you're looking at is it, it's quite it is small. I mean, my, look at this, my hands in there, my big old. That shows you kind of how small this is. <laughs> but this this part of the dungeon is um, is a bit broken up around here. Maybe I'll add a bit broken up over this side as well. Like that. Right. Um, Nightbird Games comes in with uh, Cody says, uh, "Any news on what's next for Drop Pods?" Yes, I've just I've got like just two more maps to finish off. There, uh, I'm I'm feeling really pleased, positive about it because it went out digital without the third set of maps i hadn't anticipated i'll be brutally honest with you how long those maps would take but i'm not going to launch another kickstarter on on that particular on my gaming account until all those maps are out and we printed it so um Well, I'm just wait I'm waiting for any kind of feedback and I, I've got to put a message out there I want to know what people's responses are to the game because it's still in digital and it's been sent out to all the backers and I, I just want to see if there's any feedback I've played through it a lot myself I've had some I've had two other people play it and everybody's liked it and engaged with it it's a bit different and um 
I'm just um, just working on those maps as well. So I was doing some yesterday and just chipping away at it and um, it, it has, those are nearly done. Once that's done in the new year, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do some other buildings that you can buy as add-ons to that particular game. I need to see how it evolves. When we launched it, we didn't get as much pickup as we'd hoped on on um, drop pod on um, Kickstarter. It just didn't do as well as we'd hoped. It's a game that I've sort of been developing for a couple of years, and I kind of it was like a pet pro project, and I, I think I got a bit bogged down in 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 that, and and didn't promote it as much as I should have done. So we'll see. Um, we've got a once the maps are finished. And I reckon it's going to take another couple of weeks to get those maps done. Then, um, then we'll I'll update the digital file online. Let everybody know. Ask for some feedback if anybody's got any feedback. And then we'll go to the print. We've got the we've got the book to print, and then we're going to print out. We're going to, some people order the separate map tiles, which we will then print. But we're looking. Oh, when so one of the, the major things about that is. The um, part of the problem was for a lot of the maps they have to have a pod version with a crashed pod in that map as well. So it made it kind of it 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 quadrupled the amount of maps I needed to draw. And um, you can see I've got a skeleton here. He's in that there. The thing about the ink is it looks quite heavy there. You see, which is the problem. But um, I think it still looks quite cute. I'm quite happy with that. So yeah, I'm excited about drop pods. I'm definitely going to play some on online. I'm going to play some games on this channel more. You know, I want to get out there and and do some more stuff. I'll, Rad Zone, another playthrough of Rad Zone, or continuing on, on Seth's journey, um, was is also because you can on this on this channel there are some videos. I think there's two of uh, the character Seth. Um, on an adventure in Rad Zone, um, Rad Zone Totality, and I'm going to do some more of that. It is just fitting it all in. As much as I write very quickly, drawing you just there's nothing you can't get around it. It just takes time when you do these things. So give me double doors here on this section here, and um, I assume you obviously. Um, Cody, you were a backer on that. Have you had a chance to play it yet? Not intentionally putting you on the spot there, my friend. I don't mind if you haven't. What inspired you to make Drop Pods? It, it always reminds me of Invasion of the Body Snatchers meets Home Alone and maybe a touch of MI, MI, MIB, but public, yeah. Um, I guess yes. <laughs> I love Invasion of Body Snatchers. I love sci-fi. Sci-fi is my favourite medium. Um, I have never been totally satisfied with my sci-fi RPG experiences. I enjoy playing the Turtles role-playing game. Turtles and other mutant creatures, or whatever it's called, back in the day. But uh, I never played Traveller or Mothership, um, so I, I I need to really I need to get some experience at those. I'd like to write some stuff from Mothership. All right, all the aliens role play. <laughs> it's largely been fantasy my role play experience, um, but I love the films and I've. I've read so many sci-fi novels. They all feed into that experience. Um, with the aliens, I've always been sort of... It's that, again, it's that post-apocalyptic vibe. I love Mad Max. It's like one of my favourite films. The original. Mad Max 2. And... When the world is in danger, or is, is is kind of it's worn out, or there's kind of you're looking 
and you're trying to survive. That survival thing. I love playing survival computer games like Daisy or um, Seven Days to Die. That type of thing. And so I kind of I thought, what had happened if we just had loads of aliens land and they were going to terraform the planet? How would we deal with it? What an awesome kind of situation! How how's that? how are we going to deal with that? And then suddenly, how would they how would they? And I thought, this idea, yeah, rather than fight the aliens, let's let's create traps. And um, I, uh, I just th then this, this idea. Hang on a minute. I could create like a mechanism. Traps need mechanisms. They naturally need mechanisms. And that kind of then I start to think about how could they do that? What would make up a trap? You've got different elements. Do I want specific traps? Do I have to draw loads of traps? No. They can randomly create their own elements, and then we come up with. I come up with these different. You get two tiered mechanism. You get like a, a trigger mechanism, a clout mechanism, and then a support mechanism. And you combine those, you can have two elements of that in a trap. And it might be kind of like ropes hanging and things leaning as it falls down on this alien as it hatches out of this egg. So, um, of course, uh, I, I, I absorb myself into anything that is uh, sci-fi, particularly, um, you know, uh, films and and books. I love the expanse, say for example, that's a great. Um Mothership is great, C7 says. Uh I DM two one shots and one small campaign. Yeah, I really like the look of Mothership. So um I've got it on my wish list of things to buy. And you know, hopefully um I might get it for Christmas, or I might have to pick it up after. Uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, it's definitely one that I'd like to write for. So I'm going to be looking into it. I'm, I'm just, I've just read Mort Borg. I'm doing some designs for Mort Borg creatures at the moment um, on a side project for another company. Uh, that will come into play soon. Um, yeah. So this room here is a little prayer room. Or a... What do they call it? Preparation room. The description just makes it seem more like a prayer room. This is a little... Um, um, platform. This is, let me just check here. 13... It's a little platform or uh, where they can kind of, kind of stand up at. What's the word? What are they called again? These things where they step up on the... Not a dais. A pulpit. Um, <laughs> it does say platform in the description. Oh, well. Uh, but this room's damp. And there's lots of... Around the edge, we have got these fungi growing. Yeah. And I'm going to colour these in. Some bright colours around these edges here. And I'm going to let's have some kind of almost like uh, lines of creeping fungi or light chin or something like that. And you know, to be honest, I don't get, I don't get a huge amount of time to role play, unfortunately. Um, what I'm part of the reason why I create games is because I want to play, create single player games that I can personally enjoy and play. I was talking about this before, actually, that I do like to the games that I, I invent, uh, uh, games that you know could fill my time and I'd enjoy playing them. I think that's important. What's the point in creating a game that you don't enjoy playing? So I'm always thinking about that sort of thing as I as I create. Now, go back to that question earlier on. What happens if I make a mistake? So here, can you see? 
I've made one wall too thick on the edge of this pulpit, this stand. So I've kind of thickened up both edges to make it a bit more symmetrical so the, the error isn't as obvious. So it kind of hides the other error. So I kind of match it with another thing. Awesome. So um, we've got a secret passage here. This is a secret door on this side. Some of the furniture instantly has been broken up here and smashed. And there's all those kind of fungi around that, around that area there. Looking awesome. So um, we're then moving on to corridor now this is a secret corridor so I can get away with doing a bit more cross hatching and not worrying too much kind of about it the color I've been using this one is gonna be quite dark so um, I, I kind of I like to if it's a dark space I'll definitely imply the gloom by adding in more lines and marks so, uh, in there so it comes back in here into this next room which we'll have a look at in a sec so that's a path along there. It's dark and gloomy, so people don't really keep it clean. It's full of dust and bits and pieces, and rats and all that kind of malarkey. All right, I've had some great adventures in DayZ. Ah, yes, memorable stories. If you haven't heard of Survivalist, Invisible Strain, you might like it. Big inspiration for me on my RPG zombie world. One guy has made it. Oh, yeah, no, I, I have. Um, I've seen Survivalist. I've played a lot of these games. Um, I have, which is a bit embarrassing, over 3,000 hours in Daisy. Um, it's just the most awesome game. Uh, you know, I, I will go in and role play um, within Daisy. Uh, or I'll just go out and I'll just be. Um, just just enjoying the environment survivaling the survival elements of it it is um, it is a great game Daisy if, if you want to play a survival online game that is the one I would recommend um, so this is a this room here is called the prayer room right this is the prayer room there's an altar uh, platform for speeches oh Oh, wait, was I reading the wrong one before? I was. Yeah, so this is the prayer room. Pewters, candlestick holders, tattered tapestries, uh, a platform. So we've got a platform here. This is the platform area. For a platform, you need steps up to that platform. C7 says, I bought Mort Borg, but have not have not chance to play it. Now that you mention it, I'm wondering if I can make up some over the top one shot for Christmas. Can it be um, merged? I wonder. I bought more, but have not have, have not had a chance to play it. Now that you mention it, I'm wondering if it can, if I can make up some over the top one shot for Christmas. Absolutely. I mean, look. You know, having read Mortborg a few times now and at writing creatures for it, it's got a really kind of simple, yeah, grandiose kind of apocalyptic god vibe. So you've got um, a series of gods that create things and then people are kind of embedded in this space. So Mortborg. It's kind of the heavy metal role playing game. I like its design. I, I, I'm drawn to the designer. A lot of it, it, people are torn over whether they like this game or not. It's a really simplistic um, challenge, difficulty challenge game where you set a difficulty challenge for a lot of what goes on, and you've got to roll a d20 and uh, add your modifier. You know, simple kind of thing because the, the thing that's different in this that catches people's attention is the fact that the world's going to end and you've only got a finite amount of time to to do it um 
Yes, something like the night before Christmas on steroids. It could be that the world's going to end on Christmas Day. You know, they, uh, that could be play right into the the uh, into the storyline, the actual game mechanic. But um, there's a nice. It starts out with a series of. Um, you can see here. So it starts out with a series of a, a, a short narrative about the the land, the basilisks, and the two-headed basilisks, and Veru, and how they're kind of they they spill into the world, and then you get this kind of this abstract map with different parts. That'd be one to redraw. I love it. Don't get me wrong. Um, and then you get this um, Saw, Saw Cash City, and you get Grift City, and there's a few kind of big locations, and that's it. So I've been spending some time, because there's an open license on this as well, so you can publish stuff about this game, where I've been kind of creating these, characters, these creatures that have come from the interactions of the gods and the results of their atrocities, you know. And um, so that that absolutely fascinates me. Um, the rules light theme that is imagination dependent I think it's great I do having said that I love rules as well I play uh, um, war games like um, Flames of War I like Flames of War I love tanks so yeah I mean I like to throw it out there I like to, lots of different types of experiences <clears throat> Nightbird says, and eventually I got eaten. Turned out the other survivor was part of a cannibals team playing a long game with us until their friends found us. Crazy fun. Yeah. The cannibal aspect of Daisy is hilarious. Um, you do, you pay for eating human flesh in that game. It's never been something I've been really that bothered about, to be honest. Right, we've got some some water over here, I feel. Ah, now this is a... No, no, it's not water. This is tapestry. This thing here, fallen down, is a tapestry. It's difficult to fall in... It's difficult to draw cloth that's kind of gathered. So, um... I'm going to add kind of like frayed edges here. To kind of Im imply... That there's something frayed and fallen. The big tapestry has fallen down there. I might just put something up like that there. Um, that kind of it just like implies a tapestry <laughs> in my mind. All right, so we've got the steps. I might just put a little bit of shading on these just to give them a bit of depth, as we did on the, the entrance steps. And then we've got the pewters uh, down here. Um, I can't say these are all going to be precisely right. They're kind of rough. Put a bit of wood texture on these. Like so. And it's slowly coming together. I might put a bit of shading behind the altar here. Just a little bit behind there. Oh, and cross-hatch the pillars. So two pillars either side of the altar. Altar, altar, however you want to say it. And let's get these pews in. Like so. This one's at an angle. See, that was an error there, but I'll, I'll use it anyway. Okay, now, if I was just doing black and white, I'd be tempted to sort of cross hatch in a bit around here, but I'm not going to. It does make it look a bit messy um, when you're doing stuff like that. Um, I will just uh, use the pencils when I colour that in and add some shade in there. 
Alright. Some more pillars. Two more pillars down this end. That one's slightly bigger, but who cares? And then I've got some uh, some candles on a wall here. These can be light sources. There. And um, we'd have candles. Maybe we'll... Yeah, we'll just leave it like that for the moment. There's candles on the wall. And we've got a table at the bottom of the room where... I've got a cross. Now you see the second time I drew that with the with ink, it came out much nicer. And that was because I wasn't necessarily damaging. I wasn't necessarily um, copying the exact marks beneath it, the pencil. I was using it as a guide. Sometimes pencil marks are guides rather than the exact thing that you're going to be copying. Alright, I've got another canvas here that's kind of collapsed. Lots of folds there, off the wall. Going to use a bit of fraying. Cody says, how do you write your tables and events, preparation and process? I find myself redoing them again and again because I see different styles and ways of doing them and can't choose the right look. Well, that's, let's try and break that down a bit. That's a great question. Um, so, you have to get yourself into that moment. So, for example, yesterday, I wrote a table for... Dungeon Dragons for the Spider Palace, which successfully funded yesterday. Thank you. And um, we we uh, and for one of the updates, or was it the day before I wrote it? I can't remember. It might have been. Um, it was a table called Random Cocooned Body Table. Now, for that particular table, I had to think of eight examples of random cocooned bodies that you might find in uh, this palace, the spider palace where the adventure takes place and I um, all I did uh, for that I mean we can talk about lay layout in a minute but I simply just thought what's some eight crazy encounters you might get if you find bodies very, I, I narrowed it down specifically to the situation, and in that same instance, the tool that I used to support that mechanism was the line of narrative. So there was a line of narrative that gave those body, if you like, literally bodies in <laughs> cocoon bodies. Um, so I knew that. What was the background behind that table was the fact that there was these spiders in the spider palace that have cocooned these bodies. How would they get into that situation? I'm thinking about the circumstance, the narrative that fed that. Now, that's quite a specific type of example. If I was going to do like a random magic item table, that's another whole, that's a whole different ball game. In those circumstances, if I'm going to do 20 items or 40 items, I'm going to be looking at getting a mix of items so I'll do like a brainstorm sheet and I'll be thinking right I want say five of these to be um, potion based maybe five scrolls um, maybe uh, objects and I'll, I'll go through and I'll try and apply just from my general knowledge all the different categories of items into that table and um, that that would be like kind of like a basis and then once I get an object, I think about its function and its narrative and where, where it would exist or how it would exist. So why would someone make something... Again, it's the logic side of it that we were talking about earlier. So how would something exist for that reason? I mean, you wouldn't have a walking stick of flying necessarily, would you? You'd have a walking stick of support on the land-based surface. 
A walking stick has a function, so you might slam a walking stick down and it does something. Or a staff down. It may be that um, there's a blade in that. So I'm kind of combining the function. I, I kind of, for me, it has to be believable, even though it's a fantasy thing. So I am drawing upon narrative, I'm drawing upon the logic, I'm drawing upon um, how those objects are made, you know. Um, if, it, if, it, if I'm doing some random encounters for, um, say, Rad Zone. So for Rad Zone, I did, I did hundreds of tables um, as you're exploring. And I'm thinking, each time, I'm thinking... You know, if it's in the science lab, it's going to be... I'm thinking of my time when I was at school in the science labs there. You know, what were they like? I'm um, thinking of the stuff that I see on screen. So you can also reference it. You can pull up some references. And, um, and kind of work there. Now, the way... I mean, if we're looking at how things, are, how things look, then that's a difficult one. I mean... I've my graphic design skills I've had to sort of teach myself over the years. You know, I'm lucky having an art background that's that's easier said it's 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 not too bad actually. I can kind of handle it. But um there aren't that many options for the layout of a table. I think um if I, I refer to whatever game system I'm drawing it for, and I try and replicate their style of table. That it's that simple, really. I try and I try and give it that authenticity. If I'm designing my own games, and I, I can spend ages trying to figure out how a table is going to look, just by kind of experimenting, adding colours, shapes, borders, doing all sorts of things like that. It's not easy, by no means easy. Right, tell me, Cody, did that sort of touch upon it? If there's anything else, anything, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to hear your own, if you've, if you've gleaned any of your own little nuggets, you can let me in on. Right, so over here, we've got two dwarf statues here. Okay, now... Um, if we cross the barrier here, we're going to the next part of the thing. We won't do that yet. We've got two more buildings, two more rooms to do over this side. Nick, that's a great question. Um, for, I use a, a mix, to be honest. Um, I prefer using pencil, it's quicker. And I like the feel of it, but it's a, it's a more skill involved, I think, with pencil. You, you've you got to be confident. You've got to know some techniques, like laying down a nice neutral colour first in spaces. is, And that's a standard sort of art technique, so I was kind of aware of that anyway, because of my back, my education. Um, so... I say so these maps you will see I'm going to stream coloring these in as well and um, then for something like drop pods one of my solo player games I tend to uh, I use digital for that so I use photo uh, actually use um, procreate I think it's procreate yeah procreate I use a series of, of layers, so um, and then so I have to say maybe 20, 30 layers, and um, they then uh, will be, I merge some. I'll, I'll, I can shift the colours around. I can do alternative versions. Um, which one do I, I? I like. It's nice to have a mix. If I'm doing a big project like with drop pods and I've got like 50 maps to draw or like um, with, with Mark Chaplin's um, Where Humans Don't Belong, the board game, which I drew all sort of 40 maps for, 
then uh, it is quite I I I quite like going in and, and coloring on the up on my iPad, and then say for a project like this, I'll then come and do pencil work. Um, I said I, I I like the look of the pencils better. <laughs> That's probably because I'm I could be better at doing the digital stuff. I kind of a very sort of standard kind of light and shade mid tones add the add in the um add in the depth you know whereas with pencils it's more sort of more organic you get a you get an unexpected results from it and they, they look really beautiful so great question um are you and i do use photoshop a lot i use photoshop a lot for kind of design layout um making adjustments to images if i need to um messing around with layers yeah um do i like pencil digital well everything i do i scan in so uh if i have scanned this picture in, i might have to touch it up digitally um but strictly speaking i'm not really mixing them they're quite separate i may i just use digital to adjust if need be and i might alter the color depth or the vibrance or maybe up the yellow in a picture often find when you scan in you lose some of the yellows so i put i put those back in just by doing some color adjustments um i'm coming back to you in a sec cody um yeah pencils as i say is very strong yeah that kind of answers that one really no no um nick cody i've been writing table to 20 locations and it's been challenging enough the fact you've written so many tables for essentially the same location still baffles me you're a wizard toby well that's very kind of you to say thank you toby the wizard um i have and this I, I, this sounds really arrogant, but I have just got the most huge imagination. It drives people insane. It, I don't see it as a benefit. It's like a curse. It's taken me this long to find a job that really utilizes it. Um, I just can think of lots of different outcomes. I'm a. I don't know why I am, but I am a kind of like a problem solver. Um. <laughs> people can put me on the spot like so I, I my most recent job outside running my own business was teaching a special needs school every day was different I had to think of things differently every day outside the box to help these poor kids you know who didn't want to be in school aggressive types as well and you have to think on the spot I'm just lucky um, you know and I've had an art background so I, I've learned techniques of of um, brainstorming and all that type of thing. So thank you for that. Each table has one to six rows of something different. In a way, I'm making six different houses on a single house table. I've been playing with color on certain rows to show success, failure, or skills. That's a good idea. Color prompts are really good. I'm doing a dungeon crawl at the moment and I'm playing around with um, you know what what um, is the best way to distinguish the lines between the different um, uh, rows so because there's quite a bit of text on one row and then another one and it kind of all blurs together so I'm playing around which color and I'm finding like a light yellow is quite good for separating the visually that's a difficult one and um, yeah I, I know sometimes I say I'm doing this and doing this it's because I, I work on this full time. I mean, it's seven days a week for me doing this job. So I kind of like to vary it around a bit, doing commissions, designing games, hopefully, you know, and that so far that has been a successful combination. It's kept my sanity. It's hard. This is part of the reason why I'm doing these streams now because I'm a talkative person, you know, I, I have a teacher background as well. So it's quite nice to be able to talk to people and you guys have been awesome telling me stuff, your experiences, you know, um, allow me to talk about things, you know. <laughs> Try not to sound too arrogant about stuff. It's difficult when you're talking about yourself. Um, 
Yeah, so each t one to six rows of something different, yeah. Take yourself to that place, Cody. Imagine yourself in that building. Imagine walking down the street or looking and seeing houses, you know. Live it up, go online. Just, just, just sit there like half an hour online. Just type in house rooms. Use, uh, be, in, be inspired by stuff, you know. One of my favorite places to be is, is museums. I love going to museums, they're just full of stories. That's what this is all about, in America. it's stories. Look at the narrative, drag that in. We were talking about this yes, uh, day before yesterday. I mean, we were just saying, you know, how can this, um, imagine yourself there, what stories, we as a species, we just love stories. That's what this is about. This is what it's about. Imagination, stories. That's why I think the imagination evolved like it has, because we're fascinated by stories and projecting such stories into our own lives and into other people's lives. I won't bang on about that anymore, but I think you get where I'm coming from. Right, this little space here is just a, a collapsed storage room. You see that there? So you've got a barrel, you've got some shelves, we've got like a, a case here, another box, and then a whole bunch of rubble that's come down from the ceiling and some off the wall to create a kind of space you can't really navigate. <clears throat> So, we also have another special room in here. Is that focusing right? Yeah, it looks all right. This is a, a bear's lair. It's a bit of a weird thing to say. A bear in his lair. Now, is it lair or lair? Is that the same word? I don't know. In any case, this is by the chasm, and um, there's some rocks fallen down, but we have in the middle here the bear. Now, I I was really pleased with how this uh, bear came out, but now I've got to ink him in. So there's always a certain amount of trepidation of doing this. All right. Leave it there for a second. Bear with me, something I forgot to do. I'm just gonna quickly, take me a sec, just to put up a little, um, tweet here. On, um, uh, my, uh, Dark Realm Maps account here. And, um, let me just, let me just, no. let me, let me just do this, it won't take a sec. I really should be more on this sort of thing, you know, when you set up a stream, you want to send out a tweet or two, don't you? Night Towers Tomb Map live on my YouTube. Where here? Paste that in. Do do. Come say hi. Hashtag map making. There we go. Thank you for being patient. All right. There we go. 
Okay, good. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, each um, one issue for me is that I've seen so many zombie movies and more that I'm trying to write something different than what I've seen, and that's tough. I've been writing Easter eggs into them. Yeah. It's always nice to do that. God. You know, little references. The table I did the other day, I did a little reference to the stomach bursting uh, alien out of aliens when they find that woman trapped down in the uh, in the alien nest um, so okay here's here's a serious serious question that you need to think about Cody what do people want from your game it's so hard who can exactly say but there is, without any doubt, a good number of people that are going to want classic zombie stuff from your game. Okay. So, I wouldn't be too worried about stuff that is too original. Obviously great to have it, don't get me wrong. But... Um, I always, it's always, you can't necessarily reinvent the wheel so much. It, it's a really tricky one that um, I've kind of wrestled with myself. And I I haven't got it exactly right either. You know, it, it's tricky. But I ask myself, why didn't Drop Pods, an alien type game, do as well as I'd hoped when I funded it? And I think um, that people struggle with new stuff sometimes they don't really know it doesn't get as much visibility as as there he is lying on his side in his nest in his den he's had enough he's had a hard day this poor old bear there he is <laughs> I'll do. and um, so don't Beat yourself up if you do an encounter and it's like, oh, I watched that scene in Walking Dead the other day and I'm watching Walking Dead at the moment. No spoilers, please. And I'm on the last season and I've got like four episodes to go. And I'm, this is the, my favourite season for a long time. And that part of the reason why that is is because this particular season they've just gone back to some classic zombie fodder. So you're, they're in a building, there's zombies all around, and they're trying to get out. And it's good. It's good. I, I love all that stuff. I think... I think uh, it takes us to a cosy place, even though it's a scary place surrounded by zombies. I think um, I don't beat yourself up too much about that. That's that's the advice I'd say. If you cut the original stuff, then you're smart, and that's great. Do it. Throw Easter, Easter eggs in as well. People love that crap. Um, Nick says we can see your style now, but with. What techniques you experimented and ultimately decided to drop and not use? Nick, that is a, a stunning question. Okay, so my style, as you can see, is quite kind of rough and ready. Um, that is because I have tried lots of styles uh, in my drawing before all map making so you've got to bear in mind that I, I have a degree and a master's and half a doctorate in the creative arts fine art that sort of thing so I've had a lot of time to study people's people's styles and um, I I just think that when I do it I want to enjoy doing it so that's that's criteria one if you don't enjoy doing something, then you won't keep doing it, okay? That's like rule number one. Enjoy what you're doing. So, I, I like a loose style of drawing. Kind of quite rough. I'm not into a um, an overly uh, austere, exact approach to drawing. I may well love looking at it. You know, that doesn't mean to say I'm not a consumer of stuff like that. There's some great artists I love who who use very kind of strict 
patterns and styles and for me they're much more relaxed and that comes I think from a background of charcoal drawing so I've done a lot of drawing with charcoal and loose marks and reworking marks and I use a lot of paint and I quite like abstract work so non-defined images that kind of just hint at stuff so I'll make a mark like this over here and it will hint at a structure rather than trying to be exactly precise about it and in fact you find a lot of professional artists take that approach okay they appreciate um, that ultimately your eye will fill in the gaps never forget that your eye fills in the gaps so you know this is a bear you can see it's a bear because there's a few things that hint at it it's not incredibly detailed or anything he's lying on a pile of wood he's kind of sleeping and um, he's there and, and that's kind of that's what I came to throw on top of that I'll get to your stuff in a minute Cody um, throw on top of that the fact that um, I like imperfection so I like things that feel real because things generally aren't perfect so uh, I like marks I like shade I like tone I, I like how it brings things to life it kind of pops things and um, this is uh, like a edge of a carcass here so that is a big that's a big part of why my style is the way it is I like a kind of rough organic feel but that is that again has, has come from that has come from my experiences drawing um, drawing in nature and um, that type of thing that's what feeds into this the maps it's crazy isn't it so what I would say to help this is my own style so to help you approach that if that's what you're interested in achieving you just have to draw a lot and you have to kind of feel comfortable with what you do and this stuff I don't think about so much as I do it if you're doing a style where you have to refer to and copy a style and I know saying copying it makes it obvious but that then isn't your style you can assimilate some of that what that style is into your own way of drawing but you may not have reached that stage yet and I was really lucky when I came into the map making arena there wasn't really too many people that drew like me it's about five years ago now and um, it wasn't so there was a gap in the market and a lot of people came on board and suddenly had like 3,000 followers on Twitter because people were sort of seeking out alternative map styles like you've got Dyson's logo and it's very different to my style he does a different style you've got um, I keep forgetting his name Paths Peculiar very different style to me um, sort of black and white dungeon maps does isometric stuff now and um, yeah there was me set, sort of separate on my own and I kind of like I was like oh this is really nice because I love doing this style and it just feels natural so there that's kind of how I've got to that point Nick I hope that helps um, just keep drawing from when you're a child there is a natural way you make marks. It may be a way that you don't like at all, and you may feel awkward. I had to accept the fact that I'm not the greatest figure drawer. I'm kind of like a rough mark. I'll go for it and do some kind of random stuff, but that wasn't necessarily something I was good at. And then I started to draw structures and buildings, and I thought, well, oh, hang on a minute, this is, I quite like this. As far as the illustration goes, I mean, I I like drawing animals and crows and birds and stuff like that. And there's some I've got some 
some nice pictures of those around but um, no so there I try to imagine what could I do in the situation so I try to give one to three options to the for the player to choose from moral choices for example I have an event where you find an unconscious wounded survivor yes yeah um, and uh, must choose whether to spend precious medical supplies to save them that the colony might need or you can give their corpse loot their corpse that's been fun I like giving the player options yes I've made rows with options grey because I felt they're, they'd be appropriate in a zombie world I call them lurkers there isn't always right or wrong you do what you need to do to survive yeah yeah so I guess one of the things you can look at is this instantly this is like a little grave here this section leads up to the surface so I may have some kind of like grading here in this tunnel if it goes up All right, almost like steps I can you can see like this here thanks Nick I can honestly say the best things you do are the things you enjoy. They are. If you can enjoy doing something, find it and do it. Often it's so much better. You'll stick with it. I've known so many people that will say, well, I'm, gonna do, I'm gonna draw maps, I'm gonna draw something. They do it and they like it and they start to realize actually this is hard. This, this is not necessarily the thing that I enjoy doing the most. Or they start writing, they start writing a book. Uh, this is now becoming like a job. Am I enjoying this as much? Ooh. It is. It is about that. Um, are you? Do you feel like you're meant to do it? So that is. It is a tricky one. It is. It is tricky. Um, and and Cody, I like the sound of of how you're doing it. You think you have to have option, you have to give agency, you have to allow people to feel like they're making decisions in games. Um, we have, interestingly, we're now in a in a, a much more intelligent, evolved gaming environment since lockdown. The the sort of the gaming intelligence of the population has, has risen hugely because people people spend a lot of that time playing games or looking for solo games, making their own games, starting their own companies, drawing maps. You know, they had some time to, to reflect and they realised actually you can play games on your own and it's really nice to play games with other people if you get the chance. So that whole game culture has expanded dramatically. And... Um, So we've got this intelligent that people are asking questions. They know the types of games they they well they think they know the types of games they like. I just think that um, there's opportunity, but there's also um, people get a bit tired of things as well sometimes. So it's a very it's a hugely changing environment. I think that we're. We're lucky now the, the the amount of games and board games and stuff like that sometimes it seems a bit silly but I think it's it's quite it's quite special it's a it's been a, a gaming boom people look back on this period as as a as a as a way of as a kind of knock-on effect of maybe getting a bit tired of gaming on computers you know um, but so there's lots of there's a market out there people can now make a living out of making games it's more easy to do that so that's that's a real privilege you know it's it is um it's fascinating 
I love being in this industry, so. Really, really lucky. <laughs> okay, so we have completed this side of the dungeon. Apart from this bit here, we've got this room. I guess that's partly on the same side. So we need to do this tunnel. So we added this in, remember at the beginning of the stream, Midnight Tower requested that I add in some tunnels. And we're going to do that here. This is leads down underneath this this area here. So thinking about the shadow, I need to create, and you can see that that drops off down into that space there, doesn't it? Imagine going down into this space here. Yeah, we put some little trails in as well. That really kind of leads the eye into that space. Okay, it looks a little bit like a comet, but it isn't. It's, a, it's an underground cave. <laughs> Alright, and we've got some rubble around here. I'm going to add some stippling in this section as well. And there we have it. So, there, there, good, nice sharp edge. We've got another room on this side, if you like, if you're going beyond this part of the chasm. So this space up here is called the Collapsed Burial Chamber, number 15. We've got some more columns and one of them's fallen down. When I was younger, Cody says, I made maps mostly inside buildings. I made a Batman board game using a warehouse map I drew. Something similar, something familiar to the animated series. S similar. Had fun with others on that um, therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, aren't we just so lucky to have so much culture to draw upon and, and influence us and take our minds to? It's, we're just so lucky. I, I mean, I, I love Batman. I just think there's something about Batman. Well, what is it about Batman? I just think that there's a, there's a number of really, it's sometimes really good to analyze why something is so successful or try to put your own opinion to it because it makes you think about these things and uh, apply it to your own experiences. But for Batman is a really, it, it's sort of ambiguous. It's in this kind of, it's in a made up world, Gotham, that slots into our reality, which is cool. It's a dark, kind of broody, moody, gothic-y world. That, you know, that draws upon a number of influences, like film noir, for example. Um, it draws upon um, those early Hitchcockian films. Um, it draws upon um, Cthulhu mythos, um, that kind of that dark, broody world underworld. Um, it has a um, it has a vigilante, you know, who, in a world that is is uh, fraught with crime and misdemeanor and criminals and characters, but someone is standing up against it. They're doing it in a very kind of stylish way. I mean, the style has changed, obviously, over the years. And originally, Batman was more kind of uh, garish, kind of bold, more kind of patriotic type feel to it, a bit like. But the style that it's, it has embodied is, is gothic -y and dark. And people, I think, are fascinated by that, you know. I think 
that really draws people in. And you don't quite know whether there's magic or is there not magic in some, some elements of Batman. You kind of know that he doesn't have any powers, but then they come up with these great ways of giving semi-powers to the to villains, like the Joker. He's got his, his he's had his nerves severed, isn't he? So his, his skin's changed colour, and he's, you know, I know that the origin stories change a bit sometimes, and all this sort of thing. But that for me is like it's like a superpower. It makes him it doesn't feel pain. It's like um. Um, oh, what's the name of the actor who plays the Joker? Um, the young chap who died. Oh, God, what's his name? It's that scene with Batman where they argue and he breaks. It looks like he breaks his hands, but of course, if you know the Joker, he doesn't have any pain, so you can see why he doesn't feel that pain. Do you know what I'm saying? These are these are physical elements that we can take and apply to our own things, you know, our own ideas. You know, I'm in the process of, you know, as a, as a sort of downtime. Heath Ledger, thank you. Um, I'm I'm writing my own kind of um, story about heroes. I'm trying to create like an ethos and an, an IP, if you like. Um, you know, maybe for some future games. It's just, just like I'm just fascinated by the whole concept of creating characters that are believable. I think that's that's partly Batman sort of believable in a way. You know, everything that happens, they try and place in a certain reality. How about that as a concept? It's not like, not like Superman, an alien. It's it's, it's not like um, a lot of the Marvel characters. Uh, although mutants, I think, are a fascinating concept as well. I, th I'm a, I think that's a fascinating... Gene therapy is a fascinating thing. You know, gene engineering. How that all works. Funny enough, original comic series Batman used guns to kill goons and joked about it with Robin. Yeah, he did have a gun, didn't he, originally? Um, but I don't necessarily think that was always his means of doing it. it again there's that very kind of patriotic thing about you know it, things they kind of perceive things to be black and white to a certain extent didn't they the villain was evil and bad bang we shot him dead we've done the right thing ha 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 but it's far more complex now isn't it we know about psychology people villains are evil for a reason you know they do these things for a reason you know, and when you start to look at uh, people complexly, which is something that I always try and do, you realise that that person is a villain for something, and that just enriches the story, doesn't it? And you know, why is that person? Were they uh, did, did that something to do with their childhood? You know, that's made them the way they are. How is is there redemption? Can we have redemption? The hope of redemption really fills a story with vigour. You know, suddenly, oh, interested. Can this this evil person be redeemed? You know, and that's much more. That's a much more of a kind of modern narrative. Redemption. We can all be saved. You know, that sort of thing is very much a part of what today's society is about. A certain a hope for utopia. Uh, you know, Batman is far from a utopia, but um, he's trying to represent something. He's trying to fight, fight this this corruption. Um. Okay, so. We've done the burial chamber here. See the pillars fallen across here. And there's some tombs. There's some more pillars. Maybe a bit of blood. Some, some water over this side. Pleased with how that's gone. That looks good. Um, right, so. Now. Um, we're coming to the other part of the dungeon. So we've got. There's that side over there. And then there's this side over here. Okay, so 
Um, we'll carry on with the tunnel. Um, Villains are usually the most interesting characters, at least to me. I sometimes get upset when they don't win, Cody says. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm... If I... Okay. If someone asks me, light side or dark side? I'm light side every time. <laughs> I'm a Jedi... You know, it, or I—I uh, I always find it difficult to support the villain. Not to say I don't love villains. I absolutely adore villains. But for me, I'm always there's a certain satisfaction when the good guys win. How sad is that? That is just my makeup. It's taken me a long time to admit that. I think, which sounds like a crazy thing to say. This is the other uh, tunnel, by the way. But um. I I just do. I, I enjoy... Maybe it's because I enjoy the villains so much. You know, I really get involved with them. And I I, I, I love the Joker. I love the Riddler. Um, I love Harlequin. Cause she was introduced for the, through the, the animated series. Brilliant addition. Um, I love all those characters. But I still like it when Batman wins. <laughs> Sorry, Cody. You probably ah, it's not what you wanted to hear, but that is the truth. I try and give you the truth here on the channel. The truth how I see it, anyway. My truth. <laughs> Excellent. Good. All right. So the tunnel comes up here. And um, we come out on the other side of the chasm. I should certainly need to make sure I rub that bit out. I've got some rubbing to do. I go over the whole thing at the end and rub out all the all the little pencil lines. And then when I scan it in, I look at it again. I've always missed a few. It drives me insane. Right, so this is just a little storage cupboard at the end with um, some brooms. How do you draw a broom from looking down on it? It's always tricky. Um, it's kind of just like a long pole like that and a little shovel this is for digging graves there's um, some bits and pieces in there just for that like pots and and bits and there'll be a door as I say all these black walls there'll be doors here that Midnight Tower are going to put in all right So we've got a little room here as well. This area here is where they keep urns for um, cremations. So they're just circles. And what makes an urn look like an urn from above? I think these little handles on the side, they kind of give it more of an urn look. <laughs> like you got to pick up the urn with two hands. Even though a lot of urns you see in shows are just like little round pots. It doesn't really look like much when you draw that on a on a map looking down at it. Okay. Right. Let me just check something here. Okay. Right. So we've got another big urn over here. Where the smallest I might be have some sort of symbol on the top there and then some more handles when I um, when I color this in this increasing looks like it's going to be tomorrow that I do the coloring as we progress here um, I will shade around the back of that whatever color you do the early and I'll add a bit of dark behind it to the bit of shade and depth at the moment, they look a bit flat at the moment. And we've just got some circular ones here. You see again, if I slightly go wrong on the circle, which is easily done, 
I will just thicken the line a bit to try and hide that error. Like so. There we go, collection of urns. What's a map type you actually avoid making? Great question, Cody. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> what is a map type I avoid drawing? Oh, the cat's here. One sec. Hello. He's not the sort of cat you, you pick up, unfortunately. Well, you can, but if I need to. But he doesn't come on and sit on your lap or anything like that. He's, um... What's the sort of map I avoid creating? Hmm. Well, you know the isometric ones you see a lot in board games. So the ones where they'd have like a slanting wall down and it makes it look three-dimensional I just I don't think they're great um, you see them on like games like Cluedo and I just think it's a bit I'm realistic don't get me wrong I like the way they look I don't think it's something that I ever want to do because you'd have to use lots of rulers and kind of figure it out so I uh, so I kind of answered my own question there I avoid doing maps that involve using rulers because I just can't use them it's something about the edge where you draw it it doesn't ever feel right for me how weird is that that is the truth so I like to draw freehand even though it doesn't necessarily give the best results it's just a style that comes out of it. Yes, that is exactly it. Like the like in the betrayal at house on the hill. Yes, you see them in things. Like, I mean, I've tried to give a, a classic reference, like like Cluedo, for example. When you look at those rooms. I, you, you're obviously going to have to draw them out with rulers to get them exactly right, and I just, I don't know. I'm just, not, I'm not a graphic designer in a sense. I'm not a, a designer who does that type of, does that type of particular um, draw. It, again, it's it's more kind of arty, and I don't I feel like um, I can do that any justice. But uh, yeah, so I'm mean, facing an interesting problem here. This, it's not really a problem. So this room here, this is something that comes up occasionally. This is called the wall coffin room. Um, number 19, no, 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 19. Um, the, there are six columns in this room. In all the walls are deep alcoves from the floor to the ceiling, each of which contains a stone sarcophagi. In the northern part is hidden is a hidden door that the priests used to move around the dungeon discreetly. So there's a secret over here. This this is the secret door that leads through into this space here, the preparation room. But in the walls are coffins, but it doesn't really fit into the design, the layout of the map. You see, I'd already cross-hatched in the area before um, hang on. Excuse me a sec. I just we just had a a spam on the chat. I need to I need to mod mod people so that I don't know how do you how do you mod add moderator? 
Cody, you're a mod now. Okay, can you ban that? That person there, that free vert girls chat here. If possible. Congratulations on being a mod. And Nick, I'm going to mod you as well, okay? All right. If you can um, deal with that, any sort of spam like that. That actually closed my window as well. That's weird. Um... So I've got to try and think think of a way of making this room interesting now, even though there's no, nothing on the description. And I can't put the coffins in. They won't fit in. I mean, I could do it after. I could do it after. Thank you. I mean, if you can just ban them full out, that's fine with me. Yes. Ah, oh, <laughs> Cody flexing your mod muscles. Thank you. Appreciate that. Nick, you're a, you're a mod as well. Right. Again, putting pillars in to this space. So this space is just going to be pretty bare, but that's fine, I guess. Groovy. <laughs> You've got a spanner next to your name as well. Or a wrench, or whatever you want to call it. Right, because okay, so we got the pillars in, so I'm just going to basically, it's going to be just some some debris. Not every room has to have features in it, something that is easily forgotten when you're drawing maps as well. You can just leave sort of empty spaces. Because these, because um, the, the coffins are set into the wall, you won't necessarily see them from a cross section down through the room. So... Um, Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like a blank room. I'm just going to put some debris and bits and pieces around. Maybe a few hints at the fact that that's over there like that. There. Excellent. Okay, there you go. And they'll put a grid on it and that'll fill it up a bit more as well. Right, on to another corridor. Like so. Okay. Right, so, um, next corridor. Yeah, so, uh, talking about the grid, I'm always thinking, I'm always thinking, so, what is, um, what, um, what comes down this corridor, you know, where is the, um, Where's it leading to? Again, I'm going to add some more cracks in this one to try and give a, a, a sense of a vibe. Corridors are important places. You know, they're the transitional spaces. And people often think, well, I'll make those empty. I quite like when I'm writing an adventure, something will happen in a corridor just to spice things up a little bit. You know, or there's a wandering monster table or something like that that I've written for that particular space. I've got some cracks going across here as well. Quite nice to add cracks. All right, so there you go. We've got some stuff like that. Now, um, we could. Those look quite good. I'm quite pleased with how those looking. So, I'm going to add just add a couple of those in over here. I do this sometimes. If uh, for a sense of continuity, I might go in and and just if I've added an object in, I think it works somewhere else. I'll just go and quickly do that in another part of the structure sort of this is space here like so okay yeah uh, or, and just back on that um that mod thing don't feel like you have to do anything as a mod it, it's not like it, i'm not asking a commitment of you or anything like that it's just um, if we suddenly get something like that happen that could jeopardize 
the stream in some way then you're there just to sort of to do it for me that'd be that's just handy um so put crack over there we'll put a crack here as well i feel this is this is stones broken so the edges are going to be um rough and reveal um maybe uh, a darker surface underneath right <clears throat> so this room here is called the um, the funeral preparation room a room that's used for priests for embalming bodies so you've got this large table in the middle these square square that big is five foot so these this table is about six foot long this kind of gives you a sense of the scale and um, so you've got the table it's a large stone slab with textures it's kind of got a bit of texture to it it's kind of smooth and then here there's some kind of embalming fluid that has leaked onto the floor and you can see that there like that and um, we've got some tables over this side with um, flasks and bottles on because um, they're just going to be round and we've got another table over here um, with some thing that's got a long handle on it I don't know what that is maybe some boxes and another little table over here so it's kind of like there's a preparation area uh, maybe there's some I'll put a, a tube on the floor here it might be handy for drawing out the blood you know or whatever they need to do uh, or putting the liquid in to embalm the body now, I had a few little shadows in here, but as, I, as I keep saying, that will all be added later. <clears throat> oh look, I didn't finish off this space over here. Um, let's just finish off the urn room. I get a bit distracted sometimes. You know, it all gets done. It's just a uh, um, it's just what order that is it can sometimes be a bit random <laughs> so um, I put a little bit of there no problem I've seen some old movies before that had a morgue like room and they usually had a hammer to crush bones that don't burn all the way wow we need a hammer then don't we little hammer in here there it is added in there brilliant tempted to just put a few bits of shard in there or something maybe a pot fallen or urn all right um so we've got uh, that room is done there, so we just need to finish off this. Sort, well, do that room. Finish, do this one here. So this is a prayer room again, with a with a, this large plain coffin in the middle. All right, gonna draw that in here. It's got steps leading up to it. Got some more. Um, some more pillars in there um, of course if you've got steps they're gonna probably be tier they're probably gonna have uh, the, the, the join is at the angle put these in like this usually unless it's just one side This and then we'll put I'll put a bit of shade in there. They will again. This will more dimension will appear once. Yeah, 
good. And then this, the actual grave is unmarked. So I'm going to kind of do like a stone texture on top. She just kind of like wiggly lines. <laughs> wiggly lines. And then we've got um, some more pillars to be drawn here. Now on these we've got candle holders, which was Nick's idea yesterday, just at the end of the stream. Like that. Some of these things aren't exactly that obvious when you look at them. You just have you can if the DM reads the description, the room description. So, pillars, candles, there. All right, uh, let me just open these. So this is the rubble from the crack in the earth here. I think bits of rubble have fallen down. Gonna add some trails. Bit of stippling. Right, and maybe people have come and had a look at the tomb. I've got some uh, more over here. Again, just, just some little details, just brings it to life. Do you prefer working this small? Do you like making things a little bigger and adding more details? I'd imagine close-up stone floors or wood planks by you would look great as well. Yeah, I mean, they do. Um, uh, I've got a good example. I do like working bigger on a bigger scale, yeah, no doubt. So this is the hardest scale to work on. Um, just the half a centimetre, but this is the only way you can fit like a decent sized map onto a single sheet. So I'm happy to do it. It's not it's not a problem in the slightest. Um, it's just, um, I don't, I can't add the detail that I want to add in, which is a shame. But that, you know, it's just, that's just part of the job. It's necessity and um, Um, uh, let me hang on. Bear with me a sec. I'll show you another example. Let's have a look here. There's a sort of bluey tint to the picture, unfortunately. That's the white balance doing funny things. Let me try and find. Ah, here we go. So here's a here's an example of <laughs> some floor stuff. For some reason the white balance is better when my fingers in there. Um, see that there? That again is a small scale. I'll do like a, I'll do a talk through on some of these at some point. Some really old maps there. 
I keep a lot of my maps. I do send maps out to patrons. Patrons, um... Textures like that. Because right, this is larger, sort of woodwork type stuff. Um, I think a lot of my maps I've kind of sent out to people over the years. Yeah, so there's a few examples. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pick out a few maps, talk about some maps at some point. possible to do sections of this map bigger scaled and then combine it all together and scale it down to one page size would it even be worth it is is that a question uh, uh scale oh that's a tricky one isn't it scale um well it would take three times as long to get this sort of size map done i'd have to charge for like um three maps or you know two maps if it's twice the size it, it that is a tricky one I don't know whether it'd be worth it to be honest I don't think it'd be worth it this is a little room here that's sort of got um, some items in like uh, some urns and bits and pieces little storage place again there's a few little storage rooms Kind of nice and easy to do. Something occasionally get an item that's fallen down. I try and add a bit of narrative to a space. I always find that that, that works very effectively. Okay, we've got another. This is the priest's changing room down here. So you've got some clothing on the floor here. Um, it's difficult to draw cloth that's gathered as I was saying earlier on but I just do lots of layers and he's got like a mannequin that he puts his robes on there's his mannequin in the corner and there and there uh, don't forget there's a door there so I mustn't forget that it's easy to do when you don't actually put the doors in yourself these are two cupboards opposite each other he's got all these I'm gonna put a bit of texture on here little handles on there Kind of imply it's it is a cupboard. Cool. Get that just like that. <clears throat> right. So this room here has a series of urns set into the wall, which I was able to draw on there, and these urns. All in space. 
and so the actual space itself is is quite empty. I've I've done a learn on the floor here. Sort of imply its contents, but um, no. I I might when I digitally do this, I may take off a bit of this wall. So that would be a digital addition, if you like. I'm gonna kind of imply that people walk to walk, have walked towards some of these. And we've got maybe some other bits and pieces that have cluttered to the ground here. Could even have a like a crack on the wall on the floor here. Add that in like that. All very well. All right. So we've only got these two rooms left. Or this section and this room. This is all oh, and there's a little room over here. We'll do this this room first. This is like a collapsed room. Again, um, following on with the theme, this is a collapsed room. Twenty-three. Have we got any text for that? Check uh, It was once a weapons store. So there are lots of ruined weapons here in racks on the wall. Okay, so that's always tricky. Get a comment like that, you can't necessarily fit it in. Um, so um, I'll kind of imply a rack here like this. Is drop dropouts available on your website? If you need more play testers feedback, I can do that. I a actively do it for Blue um, Botic on YouTube with his dungeon game. If it is available, I'll buy it as soon as possible. Right. Um, yes, I can send... Listen, I'm happy to send you a digital copy. There is a bit of printing involved. Um, Cody, if you email me at uh, toby at drgames.co.uk. Yeah? Just say it's Cody... Um, Just email me there, and if you're going to do some work for me, I'll send you a copy. No problem with what we've got so far. That'd be great to have your feedback, if that's all right. Putting in some swords in here. So that's Toby. Andrew, how are you doing? Good to see you. Welcome. I am just working. This room is a collapsed weapons store on this map. This is a commission. Hi from Devon. Ah, oh. you know Devon. It sums up summer holidays. You know, heading down to the coast. Maybe going to the beach. I'm not a big beach fan, but uh, I do love walking beaches. Yes, I'm based in St. Neots in Cambridgeshire. Live on Dartmoor. Oh, I love Dartmoor. Oh, my God. I know. Circumstances put me here, but I will live somewhere like that in a few years once my youngest who's fif nearly 15 once she's finished her A-levels then we're going to move somewhere else somewhere where it's more picturesque you must go you must love walking you must have a dog do you have a dog? you take walking with you and you get out oh you know all that sort of thing former marine excellent so you're you you like the exercise to get out there. Constantly running. Oh, Andrew. Sounds like you've got the perfect environment for it. Brilliant. Jealous. <laughs> uh, I know. I love hiking big hiker 
If I, if I know there's a, like a stone circle nearby, I will go and I'll be there. Oh, Nick. We've got another Nick. Hi, uh, Nick. This is... Uh, Nick has been a long time supporter and a friend, and he's a good friend. H how you doing, Nick? Good to see you. Uh, Andrew says, not sure. Rather been possible in a cabin in Canada mountains. Rather be... Ah. So you'd rather be in a ca uh, cabin in Canada. In the... Uh, what did I... What did I ask? Oh, my God. Doesn't sound like you got it too bad, though. Of course, not everywhere in Devon is um, naturally that picturesque, but it is rather renowned, isn't it? Right, so, over here, we've got a... Um, we've got a statue of Tyr, or Tyre, um, here. Now, he's obviously got his beards and his hair, like that. Uh, he's got a leg back here back of his foot there and then he's got a shield I don't know whether he has a shield he does at the moment in this particular sculpture um, what's the map about sorry found you randomly and thought I would drop in well thanks for dropping in you know um, this is a commission so um, this is a, I've been commissioned, this is the outline. I've been given some description of the rooms. And then I have made uh, a pencil sketch, which um, people saw me doing the other day. And now this is um, the inking stage. And um, tomorrow, live on stream here. So make sure you click that follow button. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I will be colouring it in. And um, with pencil. So it's a commission. Um, and it's going to appear in a book. I do uh, maps. I draw maps. But I'm largely a games designer. So I... Um, I design games that um, things like Rad Zone and Drop Pods, and um, I also write modules for Dungeons and Dragons, which um, is like kind of the main thing I do really. Um, Red Sable says I love Rad Zone. I love you too. Thank you. I love you for loving Rad Zone. Yeah. Um, it's a game I love playing. It is a game that I had spent I spent many hours writing and working with and imagining I was in those spaces. So it fills me with great amount of pleasure to hear someone say that. Thank you, Red Sadle. I appreciate that. Nothing fills me with more joy than hearing people enjoy my games. So And it's a beautiful day. At Nick's place, the newly promoted Nick, as I understand. Congratulations. Uh, these are dwarfs. These are dwarfs here. They're sca statues. Would you say Rad Zone is your magnum opus? Um, well, it, it would be a little bit early to... Uh, <laughs> Because I've got loads of years, hopefully, ahead of me to design more and more games. Um, there's something about Rad Zone, which I've channeled a lot of what I love into Rad Zone. And um, so, yeah, I do love it. You know, it's, it's I'm about to say that. It's my game, isn't it? But um, I, um, I do think that it's going to last. I think that post-apocalyptic vibe is something that uh, appeals to people and it always will appeal to people. I think I just think that people love that type of thing. And um, so, you know, 
I just, I'm very pleased with how that's all gone. <laughs> Alright, there's a statue at the end of a corridor. Um, still working on that card game you're working on? Yes. Um, yeah, that's due for. Now, kind of, we've kind of penciled that in for June next year. Trade Nation. That is going to be my magnum opus, potentially. Trade Nation. It's a game I developed, and we tried to fund a while back. It didn't work out, but um, we played it lots, and I always get positive feedback, and it's a mass appeal game. I'd like to create a legacy game that everybody enjoyed playing, and you, it wasn't too niche. It's a game like you go into a supermarket and buy it, you know? Um, I'd like to leave that 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 is kind of that's the aim I mean yes it would create a huge amount of success and comfort for my family um, Bo map is looking awesome thank you yes it's coming along good to have you back in um, yeah I know. I hope it doesn't look too blue on the screen. Problem is, I, I'm, I had natural light, and that has kind of gone. <laughs> so we're we're working with it. I've got to look at getting some more lights. I might have another light somewhere around. But I picked up some bulbs the other day, and the frequency is not right. So they, so whenever I use that other light, it flickers the screen. So I've got to get some other ones. It's really annoying. I think it probably needs some warm light led into this put into the screen a bit uh, I have not had a chance um red sable when you get a chance to play it if you could I'd, I'd be very interested in your feedback by the way because I'm nearly finished on the third set of maps to put on the back of that digital file because it we had the first two main sets of maps and then the third one needs is going to be added so they're coming I know it's taken longer than I'd hoped the game is there to play um, right we're going into the main main chamber here this is the main crypt which um, looking at the details over here is where the action happens the Queen's burial chamber she's at the top here in this ornate chamber And um, yeah, Nick, that 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 game is coming. I've commissioned all new art for it, and it's all come through. So that's in the process. Have you ever considered making a dungeon board game using a large board like tw uh, eighteen times eighteen inches wide, and making a large map for players to explore, or even a rad zone board game with tokens and all? Um, yeah. I'm developing a... Uh, I mentioned before, I think. I'm developing a... Um, a... A dungeon crawler. Okay, so that is... That is on the list. So, as far as... I... The company, my company... DR Games, needs to be in a better financial position... If I'm to do a big board game. It just is expensive, and I'm just a small indie company doing my thing, enjoying doing the single-player games. But you know, I've got aspirations to make to make bigger board games, bigger card games. I've got so many ideas. I'm just learning my learning the trade, how the business side of it, how to rely on Kickstarter. You know. Um, and so the biggest games are coming Dungeon Crawl is coming that's going to be the next game after Drop Pods on that Kickstarter channel and we're going to release a free version of it first uh, we've got all sorts of plans for that and as far as Rad Zone goes we looked at doing a board game 
I looked at how that might evolve into a board game. And the mechanism, the scanning mechanism, doesn't really translate to the board game. It, it just it just doesn't... It's not very easy to do. If you did, you would be kind of restricted on the maps, and you'd have to have lots of tokens and stuff like that. And um, so we kind of put that to one side for the moment. What we are going to do with Rad Zone is a role-playing game version of it, an RPG Rad Zone, and that will mean that I'm going to really enjoy doing this as well, developing story more behind the Scrag and the Splash Heads and all the different factions that exist in that game and develop that world. Basically, um, the group of players is a group of survivors or characters in a in one of the bunkers and your adventures are going out and you know scavenging resources and objects that um, are good for the base and it but it's more of an RPG in, in environment you know and um, that's that's where rad zones going and that that, that is evolving that's gonna sort of come next year into the year Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, to develop it as a as a video game or a, a mod or an app game would be an awesome thing to be able to do. Because you could, that that would that would work perfectly in a sense. You could you could explore buildings and scan and and the random element would be automatically done for you by the app. And you could, yeah. That that would be pretty damn cool. So, but I'm looking forward to developing that. Um, obviously, you can see I've got a lot on my plate, but um, I um, I think that that would be the natural progression for Rad Zone. I just feel like the world has evolved and changed. What's the difference between Rad Zone and um, Rad Zone Totality? Good question. So Rad Zone was a success, and people started asking, "Is there a two-player version? Is there a two-player version?" And it had never been designed as a two-player game. Um, and I thought, ooh, how could, could I do that? So I sat down and thought about it. It involved making the journey charts bigger, um, adding in a couple of other things, but those rules then, it worked. And I was like, okay, um, hang on a minute. I could add in a, a few more um, companions, um, Maybe some things like Toxic Orange, a few sort of other elements that... Um, so, Totality is what I would see as almost like having done Rad Zone and ad additional rules, but more of a totally finished game. So there's not much more that I could imagine adding to Rad Zone now because I, th I feel it would then become too complicated and there'd be too much stuff to remember. So Rad, Zo Rad Zone Totality... Is compatible with Rad Zone and all the stuff that that is, but um, it, it's just more to it. It's the same game, it's just a bit more uh, refined. There's optional rules as well, so it, it's very much um, about um, trying to make it as good as I could <laughs> with the feedback that I'd got, and then so and then I threw the two-player rules in there as well. And so we had this whole, um, yes, yeah. So um, it is, uh, it is that. Now that's not to say there aren't expansions for Rad Zone Totality, because there are. There is an that, that there is the Science Lab expansion, which is available on our website drgames.co.uk and on Drive Through RPG, and that provides you with another large map that you can print out with descriptions now my son has got involved with that i've got um 17 year old son he, he's very imaginative as well and he's he's written a lot of descriptions for that and he's been uh, added uh he he's got a writing credit on that and 
you know, I'd like to get my my uh, my other my daughters have also done some drawings, which I've used in the past um, for um, uh, Rad Zone. So their pictures appear in some of the some of the work. So yeah, it's a family affair. Um, but as I say, Rad Zone is going to be uh, an RPG as well, which is coming next year. So it'll be like a setting guide within a within a role playing system. Yes, so uh, the solo aspects are massively important to the games I'm making at the moment, and the the um, dungeon crawl I'm doing is a, is a totally solo game. So that is coming. I'm going to be looking for people to test that for me. It's going to be uh, going to upload a board game geek profile, and people will be able to download the file there to be able to play the game. That'll just be uh, the alpha version, if you like. Now you can see in this here we have um, this. We've got some uh, alcoves with dwarf statues again and then we've got the burial chambers here the queen's um, chamber at the top here with candlesticks um, don't miss anything there um, yeah maybe instead um, could the role play version be played solo as well Cody that is a great <laughs> it's a great idea um, well I guess Rad Zone is that to a large extent a lot of solo games, if you look at things like um, D100 and the expansions for that, they just sort of turn to pet, turn to number adventures, really, a lot of it. Um, so that is kind of what that is. It is a solo game for an RPG game. Now, when I do the RPG, my mind will be totally on multiplayer. That will be the total focus, which is quite a shift away from the Rad Zone originality. But the chances are... That you'll be able to play that solo as well. I'll probably incorporate some sort of rule system into it now that you mention it. Yeah, maybe instead of a colouring the scan, you'd put the put tokens from a bag that had a green safe, yep, yeah, yellow, place in the spaces you move on to. Well, that is a good point. But um I think what happens is it will become very difficult to manage with all the tokens and bits next to each other. You see, they'll all knock and get... If someone knocked it, bang, you're done. You wouldn't know what you do. And how do you move the tokens on those coloured tokens? How do you move your character through the spaces on those coloured tokens? It would be very difficult. We, we thought long and hard about it and just had, had a series of meetings. Um, well, we, my wife and I, and, um, you know, brainstormed extensively. Um... It just was just proved to be be really quite an expensive endeavour. Um, so I just um, we we kind of put that to the side. We haven't dismissed it completely, but um, we feel that would be quite a difficult one to do. And I don't know replayability is important for Rad Zone in my mind. That's one of the key design elements of it. And don't, I don't think you get much of that with a board game version of it. We just have to think about it. There's lots of, lots of issues, but the role play game has got so much could happen with that, and who knows? Maybe we'll get a publishing deal with somebody. We will just have to see. Maybe, maybe we'll get some other interest. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. Um, business sense wise, I'm still developing that side of my brain. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got that. Um, so there's a few things. I, I'm trying not to get too much stuff going on. <laughs> um, but one of the things I am going to do, um, just so there's a few people in, um, I am going to be doing my... I'm going to be designing a game live. So we're going to be doing that. That will be coming up um, pretty soon. That game is going to be a festive game. So I've, I'm not allowing myself to think about any content for that yet. I want to do it all live. So we're going to do like a brainstorming sheet. 
see how I do it, think about the questions that I asked myself before I designed the game. And then we're going to... Um, um, and then we're going to um, take it from there and just see. And I, I want to get to the point where I want to... Um, I want to be in a position where um, you can actually download it and play it. So that's going to be an exciting project. I'm looking forward to doing that online. And the other project I'm going to do is I'm going to play some Rad Zone live. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll get that going as well. Um, I think the setup's all right for it. We can just about see. It's really quite tricky to set these things up so that they, they look good. Hope this looks alright on screen. Looks a bit blue on mine, but I think my internet signal might not be great. Um, yeah, totality is soloable as well. It's a to solo play is really important. Red Red Sable. Um, one thing uh, Bo says, mm, one of the things I like about Rad Zone Totality is the avoidance of combat. Very different. However, you might need to bring combat into RPG version. Not sure whether that would add or subtract from... Yeah, that is true. That's a really good thing. That's, that's a good thing to think about. I'm going to have to have a combat system, I feel. And the reason is, if you think about it, the solo version of the game... You avoid combat because it's just you, yeah. Now, if you were playing just the DM and a solo and a player, maybe you would plan to avoid more, and maybe there are more mechanisms for avoiding combat to do with the RPG, which could be a really strong kind of vein through it, taking inspiration from the solo version. Um, but if you had like a team of five players, they may well want to fight the three radheads that are attacking them. Um, who've just appeared from behind a burnt out vehicle so there so you, you're gonna have to have that but again there will be this stress this uh, there will be an element of of the avoidance of combat because I think these these characters they face they're gonna be pretty tough you know maybe not necessarily that skilled but they're gonna be able to take a lot of injury because they're, they're pretty much dying anyway because of the radiation that they've absorbed so um yeah, and they're going to face mutants. It's going to allow me to develop the mutant creatures. Um, carefully look at how we represent humans and children within the, the scheme of things. There are some touchy subjects which might not necessarily convert well to RPG. So we'll have to... There's, there's lots to think about, but it's exciting. I love all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, Osprey Games seems to publish a lot of indie developing games. Might be a good company to look into for Red Zone role playing game. Maybe, maybe. I don't know what that would bring it. Whether I, because I have to think about my company being successful. So, you know, whether it's more profitable for me to publish it myself or to get a contract with someone else um, who would pay me a certain royalty and then handle the rest of it. I wouldn't want anybody else to write it either I'd want to write it and it's my baby you know so you know I, I, I want to protect the IP that's a an important thing so there's, there's a lot to think about there you know you guys have really got me thinking thank you about these things um, yeah, having a season one, two, etc. playlist of Rad Zone videos would be also, yes, would really invest the fans in the story uh, you're playing and the characters you're playing as, yes. Or play the RPG solo with you as the leader or a squad of combat, um, for combat purposes, yes. See to our war games uh, chain reaction system as an example right nice one nice one bow ah. yeah all right these guys are the dwarf statues in that in that room there Uh, 
Um, would you guys like to see um, some Rad Zone played? Ah, agree. More videos on Rad Zone. Just read that bit. Yes. I okay. We'll definitely, definitely get that going. Yeah. Developer plays Rad Zone. Co-op Rad Zone. Each player has a bunker. Missions assigned to, by Toby. Move characters between bunkers. Outcome of mission impacts other bunkers. Wow. That's taken it to a whole other level. A, 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 a bunker uh, culture or network, if you like. Yeah, that is that's an interesting idea. Um, I think I at the moment my mind is that you play an individual in a bunker with other players. Otherwise, it becomes more of a kind of uh, settlement management simulator, if you like. Where you're trading with other settlements, maybe, or at war with other settlements, which sounds cool. Ah, oh, Nick, yeah, got to see the continuation of Seb's journey. Oh, damn, it may have to be a new character. Yes, uh, Scott Kirby's videos. Yeah, he's great, Scott. He's got a real sense of humour as well. And, um, yeah, good guy. He's supported me and the videos and appreciate that a lot. You know. So, good old, good old Scott. Go and look at his videos. Uh, Icar Icarus Bane or something like that. He goes under. And you, if you go, there's actually a Facebook group for Rad Zone. And you'll see his videos up there. If you look it, look it up on Facebook, you'll see it. Um... Right. <laughs> uh, new character works too. I might actually have like another part of Seb's journey. I just haven't edited on video content, so I might look at that and see what see what's there. I may not. We'll see. But I think we need to start a new character if I'm going to be doing it live. God, one of the worst things about um, streaming any game that you create is um, making sure you cover all the rules. It's really tricky because <laughs> you're like people automatically assume because you obviously create a game, you instantly know all the rules. And I do a large amount of them, but whether I remember to implement them all is another question. So. <laughs> And it's been a while now since I wrote those rules, but um, yeah, I'll obviously reread them all. Um, but um, yeah, uh, no, I, I I love playing, love playing that game. That's why I created it. I created a game I wanted to play. Right. So, okay, let's have a look at this here. Try and. Position this up a bit more. Hang on. Okay. All right. The only thing I've ever seen you forget to mark time is to mark time on your older playthroughs. Yeah. Yes, there was uh, that, and I think there was another element I forgot to mark on as well. I may have missed some radiation or something like that. I get a bit ca caught up in the the action, the story of it all. <laughs> Which is, you know, and I say to people, actually, you know, there's no right or wrong. If you're like, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you kind of feel, a, Bo, you feel a bit more kind of pressure um Bo says, lol, everybody forgets rules, so, lo so long as you enjoy the session, exactly. You've got to enjoy it. And But there is a bit more pressure if you're the one who created that game to remember all the rules. <laughs> um, just a little bit, which I, I don't mind. You know, I, I, I'll deal with that. And, um, you know, it's definitely, it, it, it's the sort of game that would work well, I reckon, on, on a stream, so we'll get that going. We'll get that going. But tomorrow, um, 
tomorrow, as long as there's nothing on tomorrow, I don't think there is, I'm going to be streaming, uh, doing another session, streaming this, uh, colouring this in with uh, pencils, uh, which is a different, which will be a different experience than than this, and I'll, I need to, I need to look at getting another light that will make the colour more real. So, yes. So we've got a couple of things coming up. Um, spread the word about the channel, if you don't mind. Um, we've got, we're going to create the game live, and we're going to play some Rad Zone. And depending on, um, uh, we might play some drop pods as well. I'm also going to, um, so we've got lots of things coming up. So hopefully people find that um, exciting. Um, and um, yeah, I've just by doing this as well, it's helping me with my sanity because I work on my own at home all day. I've got a, I'm really lucky. I've got a really nice office and I'm a big collector of toys as well. Um, we can talk about that sometime as well. I'm also interested in doing some streams about um, other things like um, books or discussing subjects. So for example, this book here, this is um, Game Wizards and it's about um, Gary Gygax and um, Dave Arneson um, and their, their voyage where they created Dungeons and Dragons and the kind of argument over who created it and that sort of thing. I've read that and it it's a um, fascinating story. I know and I kind of feel like it'd be nice to have a, a, a chat about something like that and um, uh, just maybe highlight sections. I could highlight a few sections and read them out um, and just have a open up a discussion about design and how it's perceived, especially when two people are given credit for designing something. Um, so I'm thinking about doing some stuff like that. I don't know what you guys think. What do you think about that sort of stream? Um, the Stormtrooper helmet isn't life-size, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There it is. It's not life size, especially not my big head. It's got something inside it. I can't remember now what's inside it. Um, yeah. So I, I love all that. I love all that culture and all that type of thing. It uh, completely fascinates me. And um, it's again, it's those worlds, isn't it, that we create that I'm that I just love being part of. So, um, did you have anything to do with the Dungeon School software? It looks similar. No. Listen, I, I think there's over the years. Over the excuse me. <clears throat> Let me just over the years, I've been asked to draw the maps for numerous um things i think they may dungeon school may well have asked me to do some maps or a card game similar sounding to that and it, for some reason it didn't work or i was too expensive <laughs> people the people that never expect to pay much for maps it it does amaze me um because the maps are something that people always refer to and it's not that they it's partly to do with the fact that they don't have a huge budget themselves, a lot of people that approach me. But, um... Do they? <laughs> I'm going to write this down. Uh, listen, I I'm happy if my, um... If, my, if I inspire people to draw similar. I'm always in trying to encourage people to draw maps if they want to draw. It doesn't matter. I, over the years, I've had people ask me detailed questions about how I draw maps, and I'm happy to answer that. And and then they go off and they draw them, and they send me pictures um, and show me the stuff that they've done, um, uh, which is fine. You know, I, I don't care. And uh, 
Um, Bo, uh, well, it's always, you know, if you're going to miss tomorrow, don't, don't worry, it's it's up on the YouTube channel. So uh, it's there, and there's. I want to do a lot more of this sort of thing. Um, I find, I, I love chatting to people online, and as I say before, I, I don't get, I'm working on my own here, so I'm kind of going crazy. My wife gets in, she works with special needs kids as well, and she's tired. Last thing she wants to do is talk to me for ages about stuff because <laughs> she's tired. Although actually, she does quite like to to get stuff off her chest because it's she works in a hard, really hard environment. So it's a bit of a funny thing. And Dungeon School I owe you some money. <laughs> Look so f well, that's fine. You know, don't worry. This this cross hatching is not my concept. That has been around a long time. That was around when dungeons were first being drawn. So that isn't my idea. The, the my style is a scratchy style, so that is that's that is how it how it works. Dungeon Scroll uses hatch hatches, which has been used for a long time. Oh, but it's made more popular by Dyson. I think Toby has a distinct artist story take on his drawing, however, which makes him unique. Well, to be honest, um, I've been around for about five years now. Dyson's been around about ten years. But I hadn't seen any of Dyson's maps before I drew my maps. So I went, came into it raw. So the style you see is this cross hatching comes from the early Dungeons and Dragons modules, which was happened a long time before Dyson started drawing his maps. So the cross hatching isn't, doesn't, can't be traced to anybody in particular. This is filling in a space. It doesn't belong to anybody. And Dyson and my stars are, are quite different. You can see actually, if you look at how our maps work, they're they're very different. Um, so you can see that I've actually <laughs> taken, not in a negative way. I, I it's, my map style is not directly inspired by his. What I'm inspired by is his commitment to map making, which is and the fact that he does that. And and for me, that isn't for me my main thing. My main thing is the narrative and the story, as I've been talking, as Nick mentions there. So the story is uh, the, the writing, which is what I'm really interested in. The maps I enjoy doing, don't get me wrong, but they purely supplement um, the stories I want to tell, um, which is which is hugely important for me. Uh, otherwise, I would keep doing the maps, I enjoy doing them, but the stories make it much more of a bigger thing, so there's more of it. Like with Drop Pods, for example, that game, there's loads of maps and loads of content which just just keeps on coming and um, it, that map element of it is somewhat overridden the writing element which hasn't settled well with me and I've learned a really hard lesson with that game that the map element can't be the thing that overrides a project for me so which kind of seems um, counterintuitive to where it all started for me five years ago with this map making um but um you know I, i've evolved and changed we have our company dr games it's under the dark realm umbrella we have dark realm role play dark dark realm games dr games and dark realm maps so it's all part of that dark realm umbrella which can sound a bit complicated <laughs> but that's just how it's kind of slotted together yeah yeah, maybe we'll look at some of my toys and stuff like that, my collections in the future. But at the moment, we've got those 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 two things. We're going to be doing the, um, we're going to be doing um, designing the game, uh, and uh, Rad's own playthrough. But we're also we're going to be doing um, uh, finishing this map off. I will be kind of filming the map commissions. It's nice for me to. Uh, I, I watch a lot of TV when I'm drawing. But I prefer to be able to communicate and chat with people. So this is brilliant. Okay. Um, we are going to leave it there, guys. And um, it's been awesome. Absolutely awesome. Nick, I've modded you. Cody, I've modded you as well. And I think I scared off someone else um, with a mod as well. Who was it? Earlier on. Uh, oh yes, uh, another Nick. 
Um, do you think... Uh, another question here. Um, designing the game is an awesome, interesting one. Do have... Do you have a concept in mind already? Yes. Christmas Santa... Santa and that's it. There. Stopped already. I, I don't want to... I don't want to think about it now. Once my brain starts on something, and then it, it just keeps going. <laughs> and I, so I'm, I'm really learned over the years how to say, right, brain, stop. Think about something else. And um, so I'm going to save it for the screen. We're going to do like an A3 brainstorming sheet where I do drawings and notes and stuff like that. And we'll look what I want out of that game. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. That'll probably be, I don't know, whether we'll start this week. Potentially we'll start this week. Uh, what day is it today? Wednesday? No, probably not then. Probably start it Monday or something like that. And because um, I want to get that developed, written, and and then published before Christmas. So I'm thinking one thing that has popped in is a game on one sheet. So we'll have a look at that. It may not be that. We'll just have a look. Um. So that's coming. Yeah, everybody else keep their minds clear as well because I, I want you part of that creative process but I don't want you coming in with loads of ideas I want you to see what happens and then we will design it together kind of like a design experiment and um, uh, Cody has said do you think having so many different co uh, com companions hurts hurt some games for example some people know DR games but others know Toby Lancaster on Kickstarter yeah uh, companies hurt companions I think are you talking about my identity yeah I think people need to get to know me that that is part of the reason why I'm doing this I think out of all that Toby Lancaster needs to emerge in a sense as the figurehead which is why I've changed my icon to this little picture my one of my daughters did of me because it's beyond it's, the company has evolved what you've witnessed there what you're witnessing is the evolution of a company and what the, through the things that I want to achieve through doing that are going to have to be facilitated in a particular way and how that happens is still it's still it's still evolving so this is part of that process yeah so um that is very true so it is about it it is toby lancaster so that is you know it, it does feel weird to talk about yourself i'm i'm not a very sort of prideful person um i spent a lot of my time teaching and helping other people but i've got to be bold and try and be confident and and kind of step forward if you like as a designer and um and and see and learn my lessons and see how it goes and see whether people accept fortunately another sort of middle-aged white male heterosexual male um with a gaming background <laughs> which i had a slightly different profile but this is me you know this is who i am and uh so hopefully that doesn't count against me um but we'll see uh, i i'm just trying to be honest and try and be who i am um, for example, you said drop pods didn't do as successfully as you expected. Would it be? Uh, could it be? It was under Toby Lancaster banner on Kickstarter rather than DR Games. Well, DR Games doesn't have as big a profile, I don't think, as as I do on because Kickstarter. You know, I get a thousand people backing at Kickstarter, and at the moment there aren't that many people buying my games on, say, Drive Through RPG or, or off the website. They they both merge into one. So on. On the Kickstarters, I put down their Dark Realm roleplay for say my those games and DR games for the for the uh, games like Drop Pods. And I put them in the description of the Kickstarter, so hopefully people are connecting the two. We'll see. It's an identity thing, isn't it? Well, I guess we'll just have to kind of work with it and and see, you know, how that how that evolves. Yeah. So, yes. No. Um, we're going to end it there. We've been streaming for, I think, what is it, nearly four hours? It's quite a good stream. 
Maybe it's three and a half. I don't know. It says started three hours ago here. Um, that's a good stream. Um, I've got the map to this stage. We see where I want it to get. And then we'll move on to the colour tomorrow. So um, that'll be there. And maybe I'll try and stream it slightly later. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, the problem is if I do go later, then that means that um, I my children get home. And they bugger up the internet. So we'll just have to see how that goes. Um, yeah. Guys, stay safe. Um, and I will um, see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I've really enjoyed your company. And um, we've got big things ahead. So uh, thanks again, guys. And I will see you very 